is not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it! Now let's do this! Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 140 of the Golf Guru Show. I'm your host, Jason Sutton, Director of Instruction at the beautiful Colleton River Club in Bluffton, South Carolina, where it is my mission to break down high performers in the teaching and coaching business, as well as all fields of study. Make sure that you download this episode and hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes that will be coming your way. All I ask of you is share the podcast on social media and with other coaches and players that might benefit from this information. My guest this week is my friend, Steve Moore. Steve is a teaching professional from Toronto, Canada, but as you will learn from his accent, he is originally from Dublin, Ireland, and has had an incredible journey in the teaching business and the golf business in general. Steve is a young coach that I have had my eye on for some time and have gotten to know very well in the last year. He is a superstar coach on the rise that is quickly making a name for himself, that is getting after it with his continuing education and growing knowledge base. This guy has completed more certifications and shadowed and spent time with more top coaches in the last five years than most of us could do in a lifetime, which says a lot about his growth mindset and his thirst for getting better. Steve has spent time and is certified by a strong list of coaches, include, but not limited to, Scott Calx, so he's Scott Calx certified, James Ridyard, so he's Wedge Matrix certified, Sean Foley, Stephen Sweeney, Rick Sesinghouse with the Flow Code certification, Dr. Mark Bull, Dr. Mark K, Dr. Kwan, so he's level one certified with Dr. Kwan, Jeff Smith, and George Gankus, and he's also TPI level two and three certified. So this guy's getting after it. The list goes on. Like I said, Steve is doing the work, which I respect so much. Oh, and by the way, he also hosts one of the best new coaching podcasts called Shamrocks and Shanks, which you should definitely check out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Also, give him a follow on IG, Twitter, and TikTok at Steve Moore Golf. In this wide-ranging conversation, we get into a ton of stuff, including our take on what we learned from Doctors 4, the coaching seminar that we just got back from a few weeks ago, which we attended together, which was amazing. There were so many amazing takeaways from this convo. And it was just so much fun to do and and chop it up with Steve. So I hope you enjoy it. So sit back, get out your notepad and enjoy my good friend, Mr. Steve Moore. Stephen Moore, thank you so much for taking the time, man. Welcome to the show. It's been a long time coming and I'm really excited to to chop it up with you. Uh, I'm absolutely humbly honored to be on the show. It's a mixed emotions. I'm, I'm glad I got on here before Mike K did, but we all know he takes a long time to get anywhere. So I was always probably going to be appearing here. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely delighted um, and, and very, very humbled going from listening, as, as I said to you before, how inspirational and how much your podcast has helped me listening to these podcasts to finding myself a couple of years after that's all started to be on the show. Yeah, no, I'm very, very humbled. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're, we're going to get into that. Most don't know about Mike K, which we'll get into at some point in the show, but I'm a huge admirer of your progress through your career. And, you know, we've known each other for a minute, probably longer than people realize. And probably will realize a lot more as we get to, through this talk, but really, really big fan of what you're doing. And a lot of people don't know kind of where you come from, right? Aside from the accent, Right. Then I realize you live in Canada right now. But so so take us back and like give us a little backstory from how a kid gets from Ireland to Austria to Canada <laughs> and where you are now. Obviously, obviously being in Ireland, working through, you know, playing some golf, then realizing, as probably most coaches do, you're not good enough to play the game. To kind of moving into that coaching sphere, had the opportunity early on in my kind of coaching career to go to Austria, which was amazing. Spent a year over there. Ironically enough, decided not to stay there because I didn't like winters. Now being in Canada, we can see the kind of, you know, the paradox that that kind of presented. But 
moved on from Austria back to Ireland, was coaching a little bit at Ireland. And then, to be honest with you, I, I had my brother living over in Canada. I'd been over a couple of times and seen the golf industry over here and the opportunities that I provided being closer to the States too, uh, in terms of going down educational wise, kind of was a very, very attractive proposition. So a couple of myself and a couple of my mates did a two year visa, holiday visa over to Canada and came over and just eventually decided to stay. Just loved it. Loved the, as I said, the proximity to the States. I loved the golf courses. Yeah. I just loved the kind of the industry here. So it was just very, very attractive all around. And yeah, that was now seven years ago and been in Canada ever since. So that's a very, very short synopsis of how I got here. Yeah, so you're leaving a lot out there, right? So, yeah. I mean, as far as like your journey, because it's really, really interesting. And I know that's kind of when we first met, because you took the typical route of like being an assistant and like, you know, becoming a head professional. And then you had a decision to make to like, what's really leading me into the next phase of my career? So talk a little bit about that. And I've got more questions on some of the things that we've talked about as far as how you how you based your decision on, you know, becoming a full-time coach, but dig a little deeper into that and then we'll, we'll sort of flow into the next phase. Yeah, for sure. Like when I did first move over to Canada and started working, I think I was still in this kind of what I kind of refer to as a Niagara state, which is basically kind of like you're a little bit walk, like kind of floating on that Niagara river, not do really doing a whole lot, not really paying attention. And then suddenly you get to the falls and you realize, holy shit, like, I, you know, I got to do something here. So I think I was a little bit in that state when I first moved over to Canada, not really like enjoying life, but not really going anywhere. And then very fortunately, I decided to go into a coach camp one year, about four years ago with Andrew Rice. And that's where I met a couple of people that you would know, Mark Grace, Robbie Fales and Billy Orr, ended up sharing a house with them. And that really was the instigator for my passion to get back coaching. So that couple of days really kind of got the fire lit under me again. And I got home and I, I kind of looked at where I was in life, to be honest with you, in career and really wanted something to change. And it was at that point in time, I kind of just stood back and assessed where I was coaching wise, how good I was or, or not good at that time and realized the strengths and weaknesses and the weakness being technically, I, I just didn't know what I was really doing, to be honest with you. I'd gotten by on my communication skills and, you know, that Irish kind of like friendly banter kind of thing through a lot of sessions, and which is a good thing. We can talk about this a little bit more if you want to be a little bit more direct about it. But then from there, I kind of went, okay, well, how do I get as good as I can be? Right. So, you know, I think I was like 35, 36 at that stage. And I was like, I don't have the experience that everybody else has. I'm kind of on the back foot here. What path? There has to be a way to make this work, right? There has to be a way. And then it was kind of looking, okay, well, how can I do this? And I was like, right, I got to stop doing a few things, change the perspective a little bit, you know, and really look at the educational side of things. And that's where I really kind of started going, okay, well, I got to go visit people. I got to annoy people. I got to make myself known. I got to create relationships. I got to do every certification, education, whatever way I could. So it was just really, you know, you kind of want it as much as you, you want to breathe. And, and that really is kind of like the platform for everything. And you just have this mantra of just, I'm not going to say no to anything. That was the head start to it anyway, it was that passion got lit. And then I started traveling and I visited with George and, and Chris at certain events and, and stuff. And that really propelled it to, again, too. You always have that sort of like in junior golf, we call it ignition, mm -hmm. right? It's like into your next phase of whatever you're pushed towards and whatever you kind of get on fire from. I mean, I talked about that when I was on your podcast and we'll get into your podcast at some point as well. But as Jim Rohn says, is like for things to change around you, you have to change. 100%. So talk a little bit about some of the personal changes that you made that you feel like made a, made a difference in your life. Probably the major one was just stopping drinking, to be honest with you. So, and it's, it's a kind of, it's a funny topic because for all number of reasons, but mainly being Irish. And, and then whenever you say it over in Canada, people like, oh, oh, you stopped drinking? I'm like, no, no, I didn't have a problem, man. Like, I was good. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, no. So, you know, that, that first, I think, after I came back from coach camp and then I went out and spent some time with George. And then I think it was the following year, I, I did it for a dry January, just like yeah, as a lot of people do. Did it for a local cancer charity too, which was kind of cool. And just noticed some really, really good things came from it, to be honest with you. It wasn't like a clear intention. Like if you'd said to me before that, like, probably wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't believed you. And then that kind of like, it, it's just momentum, to be honest with you. It was like a snowball then. Everything good started happening. And I was like, okay, well, there's, it's not coincidence, you know? So 
and we could talk about environments and stuff, and I don't want to get heavily into that, but you're brought up in certain ways doing certain things where you're born. And to be honest with you, you know, when I started, like, not to get into the whole drinking thing, but you were brought up in a certain environment to do it, right? It wasn't very productive, let's say. So when I kind of stopped doing I started realizing all these good things. And when I started then, okay, well, I got to change that. That led to me being more productive seven days a week. Then I was being more productive. Then I would get frustrated that I was being too wildly crazy about all these different things. So then I'd have to get more channeled in my vision, which helped me along. Started working out again, which helped that along. Started listening to more podcasts, you know, like yours and stuff that really helped me kind of develop and help point me in the right direction. And it was just, it was all beneficial. I I started getting really, really nice momentum. And it, it came quite early. I was very lucky when I reached out to people. They were really, really helpful and receptive like that. I think March, February, I was in Vegas with Jeff Smith for a couple of days, which was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> some good stories there. I went out in the golf course and he's talking about do you play? And he turns around to me and goes, you know what I'm talking about, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing you do at the airport. Yeah, yeah, of course, man. I know what do you play is. <laughs> and so then in, in March, I ended up going to, uh, I, I came back from Vegas and we'd only had two days. So I, I messaged Chris Como. I was like, Chris, I'd love to spend some time in Texas with you. And Chris was like, yeah, listen, I'm not there. He goes, I'm out on tour. I'm like, where are you going next? And he goes, I'm going to Palm Beach for the Honda. I'm like, okay, I'll see you there. And I was like, I, like literally, this was like the night I got back from Vegas because Jess had been cut short too with the with the weather. It was a little bit cold out there for people to come. And I was frustrated. So I was like, okay, let's do this. So I booked tickets, told the girlfriend, okay, I have to go in, in another four or five days, which she wasn't too happy about. But anyway, she, she understood. And then, yeah, I flew out to Palm Beach, went to Honda, and I literally stood on the range on the Tuesday. I got there Monday night, went onto the range on the Tuesday morning to meet up with Chris. And I, I've told this story to people before. It was the first time that I really felt complete in my life. Like, I felt like, you know, the, all the jigsaw puzzles had kind of connected for the first time. Mm, yeah. And it was a very, very powerful feeling and again because the reason i'm connecting this all it all goes back to the momentum of before and it's just more and more and more and you're just feeding that great beast of energy and momentum and passion and again yeah listen you know to get out there was you know when when i talked to chris chris was like yeah you listen you can hang out with me whatever but you need a driving range pass and i was like can you hook me up he goes no (laughs) yeah (laughs) and i'm like you can't can't get that yeah it's no it's not his responsibility it's it's a player thing so i'm like okay cool so this is all hinging on me getting a pass now. And we're like four days away from the event. So then I contacted PJ Tour. They told me no. Contacted Honda. Obviously wasn't getting through there. And then I actually reached out to Shaheen in Montreal, who knew the source in PJ Tour. So I emailed her, fed her a few fruits and not truths, and got the pass emailed to me when I was on the plane flying over to Palm Beach. And so literally, yeah. So you got, got a player, got you had a player assistant pass? Yeah, it's, it's hanging up back there. I could show it to you. So it was range, clubhouse, the whole nine yards. But yeah, that that allowed me to kind of hang out on the drive range. And like that week was transformational because that's where I met Stevie Sweeney. He was doing some stuff for uh, Paul Hurian at the time. And I walked over to the Pudding Green and we just started chatting. And he was like, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from Dublin. Where are you from? He goes, oh, I'm from like Ireland too. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, you know, we started Royal County down. And he goes, yeah, I used to work down. I was like, oh, my mum lives there. And he goes, what's your mum? And I'm like, ah, more. And he goes, geez, I know where like I used to. So. That was a great relationship there and I talked to Pete Cowan that week. Obviously hung out with Chris a little bit. I got to see Jamie Lovemark and Chris's relationship as they worked on things. So that week really, uh, it wouldn't be too much of an embarrassment to say that week probably changed my life an awful lot. Point being, from, it all came from deciding to do something, go out to Vegas to see Jeff, disappointed it didn't go as well as I wanted it to because people didn't show up because it was cold, to getting home and going, no. And that's that's not it. That's not how it's going to end. I'm going to do something more. Text Chris Como. What's the worst he can say is no. He says yes. You need a pass. OK, I'm going to get one. I actually I have to message in my phone where he replied and said, e- e- I can't get you one. You're going to have to get one. And I actually have a reply with me going, don't worry, I'll sort it out. And I had no idea how I was going to do it. But I just knew that I was going to get it somehow or another. And and that's again, it's just momentum. Like And, and when you're that willing to do something, it's you'll find a way. And I go back every year, bar COVID and bar this year. I was there a couple of weeks beforehand this year. But yeah, it's when you spent time with Foley, right? And some other guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's just, it just shows like why you're great and why you're going to be even better is that kind of mindset, right? What other habits did you adopt in that momentum when you're actually sober and 
clear headed. I get a lot of, and I pay attention to this, obviously, when I've interviewed people like high performers in whether it's golf or anything else, it's like you start to see patterns, right? Of what people do that are successful, what other things do you adopt? Well, definitely like in terms of you start wanting your time to be more productive. So that really started changing. So now I had this free time where I had more energy and I like, I really wanted to make the most of it because this is now what I'm going to do. It's like, okay, you start constructing schedules and timetables. And well, like, I think I only really hit on what I, a really good way for me about four weeks ago. And that's been like three and a half years in the making. So <laughs> that's probably not a good advertisement for my pro- productivity. I, I think in all honesty, it's not so much a habit. I would say it's a, probably a trait my awareness grew and it really changed my awareness of of me as a person and I, I don't want to get all like people who know me know I'm not that philosophical or anything like that but definitely my awareness of of who I was and you know what I had to do to get better and that's that's a tough tough thing to go through I, I I got to spend some time with Brett McCabe a couple of months ago and he came up like we talked for about an hour and he came up with a really good saying at the end of it and he goes you know what, like, it's fine to be hard on yourself. Just don't shit on yourself. And, and I, I found maybe... It's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, and when I look back at the... I think I always wanted to do the stuff that I ended up doing when I started changing how I went about it. But I would get more frustrated beforehand because I wasn't in a position to do it. So, you know, that trait of, like, being massively frustrated myself kind of dissipated because I was being more productive. So I started getting a little bit happier. And, you know, I just started, like, it's it's... It's like anything when you get an objective in your mind, you know what I mean? And you start being successful with it. Like that's where it starts to blossom and it starts to grow. And, you know, then you start like listening and opening your mind to all these other things and becoming aware. Like, you know, you talked about Jim Rohn earlier on. I would never heard of Jim Rohn until I listened to your podcast, man. Not a, uh, and not that guy changed my life, right? I mean, the yeah. guy, I never met him, right? It's like mentor from afar, but that was, it makes me think back to when I was in my mid to late thirties doing what you're doing now in a different way of that, you know, automobile university. Like it's just listening to stuff or, or just, you can't get enough of it. You're just basically on fire to like absorb everything you can. All right. So that, that leads me into a really good question, right? So I might have talked to you about this at Dr. Swarp, but maybe not. And this made me think of it when you just said that last statement was, where is the line between embracing imperfection versus striving for excellence? I think I think cutting yourself overall some slack, I think, is a very globalized look at that statement. I think being very clear cut in your mind, again, going back to the awareness, the honesty of, OK, well, where am I at? Like, what am I trying to do here, honestly? And it's OK to have any answer you want, right? Everybody's going to be different. But if you go, OK, well, I want to be the best coach in the world, hypothetically speaking, right? If that's what you want to do, well, then you got to be very aware of where you are lacking. And again, you know, you can say, okay, well, you know what? I'm not the best with math, right? When I look at Dr. Kwan stuff, you know, it's kind of like a beautiful mind shit going on there, you know? Yeah, for so sure. So that's an imperfection that I'm okay with. I'm comfortable with that. I know it's not my strongest kind of point, but I will still try my best to be better at it. I, I think, so when you embrace imperfection, you realize you don't have to be perfect at it. You just maybe need to improve a little bit. And, and that's what, I've kind of always, you know, I had people really try to push me certain directions when I started on this road, like trying, you know, get a thing, man, you know, get a thing like, be, you know, you got to need, you're going to need a thing. And I was like, I, I don't know what it is. And, I, and that got me for a little while, man, honestly, like that got me for a year and a half, two years where I was like conscious of that nearly every day, like trying to look for something to be someone else to be. And then I was like, you know what, it'll find me. Just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I think I'm getting there in terms of that. But again, like, it's okay not to be great at everything. And I, I think that's maybe in the last year or so, I've gotten to realize that, that that's okay. As long as you're trying, I think that's a good thing. If, you, if you're very conscious of like being, as you say, imperfect or, or not great at something and you just dismiss it, I think that can be an issue. Yeah, I think another conversation is like, do you build on your strengths or do you try to improve your weaknesses? Right. It's a, it's a tough, oh, man, you're firing them. Yeah. It's a tough line. You know, I'm just thinking it from a player's perspective and also from us as coaches is I don't want to be one thing, but I want to be pretty good at a lot of things. But then you spread yourself so thin that 
a lot of times we don't get good at anything, right? We talked about it a little bit earlier. Yeah. But it's just, it's such a, it's, it's such a fine line that we have to sort of walk. And it makes me think about, as we'll get to with, with our, our boy, Dr. K, you know, the conversation we had in the house, like, I can't do that. I can't do what that guy does. Right. But you're like, and you, you kind of brought me back to reality. He's like, he can't do what you do. Right. So every, you know, you have to have, yeah. And that's where, you know, especially when you're working with tour players and you're working with high level players is it takes a village. A hundred percent. Like, I I think, I think in, in answer to that last question, you know, I think a lot of things find you. I found that in the last two or three years where I work hard at getting to know stuff. I really, really do. But I realize I'm not going to know it all. But I'm very open to learning if the, if it comes across my plate where, you know, if I get a player like, you know, that would be better working with Sweeney. You know, I sent a couple of guys down to him where I'm like, that's cool. But maybe I might talk to him afterwards and go, hey, what did you do? Just just so I can learn from that, too. So I, I think the player sometimes or, or your your students or your team kind of instigate that side of learning a little bit. So, you know, like I said earlier, I'm like super impressed with like how aggressive you've been to getting the knowledge, right? Like I talk about the, I mean, and it's like, I don't spend, you know, I get a lot of, I'm not tooting my horn here, but I get a lot of requests to like be a mentor or just to like give out information. And I, I look very closely at the individuals, like, what are you doing? Right. What are you doing to better yourself? What are you doing to continue your education? And I've found very few that, that have done more than you have, like with all the certifications and all the time that you've spent. So doubling back, you know, we can go into like some of the certifications and I've got questions about that. But if you had to give advice to yourself, let's just say 10 years ago, eight years ago, before you started on this journey, what would you have done differently? And what, what would you have said has worked out? Worked out, I'm here. So obviously something's worked. I got, I got there in the end. I think if, if I was going back 10 years, I just would have liked to have started the process earlier. I would have liked to have found it earlier. But again, you know, I, I really, really believe there's, I forget the phrase, but there's this Japanese saying, and it's about when they have four different flowers in the country and each one of them blooms at a different time. And it, it struck me when I read that one time and I was like, that's kind of the way it is. You know what I mean? You, you, you're not meant to be 10 years previous or five years previous. You are where you are. And you know what I mean? So I know, I know what you're getting at. And like, if I could go back, so like, if you were to, like, if I say, okay, well me 10 years ago, and I bump into him tomorrow. Hey man, you know, cut out the shit, dude, you, you've got a talent to, to coach people. You're good with people. You love golf. You're passionate about it. Stop doing stupid shit to mask that passion and to kind of dull your life a little bit and, and do more. But again, I was talking to a player about this this morning. I was working with him. Like it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to see the far side of the riverbank. You know what I mean? And if you can, if you, if you could see two years in the future, especially when you're working with players, like if you could show them two years in the future of their swing, if you work and do this and this, like they would do it for sure. They'd be all in. But when you can't see the future, it's hard to invest. And it doesn't work that way, blind piece especially of in golf. Needed. Yeah. Yeah. Better question. And I had this actually written down was, you know, what certification or time spent with a coach or education wise had the biggest influence on you over the last five to seven years? Mark Bull. Okay. Don't even we'll talk about that. that one. Why is that? When I referenced awareness earlier on, I think he changed my perception. I think you can sit down and read a book this afternoon uh, as a golf coach and you can read on whatever you want to read up on. It's, it's all good. You're educating yourself. Fantastic. That's just information. I think to change someone's perception, I think is probably one of the most powerful things you can do. And Mark Bull has done that for me, not only as a coach, but I think as a human. And that's a big statement to make. And I would include Sean in, in, in Foley in that a little bit too, from a distance and, when we talk a little bit about mentors or influences, some of them can be subconscious. So they might not even be involved. They don't, they don't know they're involved in your life, but they're still helping you. As I mentioned with you previously when we were in Virginia, but definitely Mark Bull, like it's, it's without a shadow of a doubt. He's one of the nicest human beings I've ever come across. Um, he's one of the smartest human beings in golf. I feel a very kindred kind of connection with him and the way he sees things. So when I said to you earlier on, I'm starting to realize who I am as a coach I feel like I'm more in that funnel, in that kind of way of seeing things that 
dealing very much with the human being before the golf swing, but knowing the golf swing as well. His certification, even from day one, he was so nice to me, so welcoming. I remember doing his certification. I'd done all these other certifications and, you know, I did the first part and I was like struggling a little bit with it because I didn't really know it, but I was trying and I emailed him the answer. I really knew, I knew the answers weren't like exactly what they're meant to be, but I was like, I apologize, blah, 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 your certification. And he replied back and he goes, it's not a certification. It's an education. There you go. And then he, he's just done things like, you know, we don't get into all of them, but he'll send me messages every now and then that have just been very, very short, but very powerful. Yeah, I, I just feel very a, a good closeness to him and how he looks at things, his perspective. And that's really, you know, other people have helped me massively. So I don't want to like, you know, lower down or kind of make that any lower in terms of what they've done. But if you ask me the most influential person in, in, in my life and, and probably like in coaching life and a little bit going into real life too, in personal life in the last three or four years, definitely hundred percent without a doubt, Mark Bull, it's uh, you give me the acupuncturist perspective of one needle to put into like your education. That needle has got to be Bull Academy. Just go join. If you're not a member, it's, it's, it should be mainstay of every single PGA. In, in the world. He's the best. It's a nice lead into, you know, our recent, uh, where we actually get to meet live, right? First time face to face. So emotional, it's like blind date. <laughs> I know, right? I was afraid you weren't going to like me. So we recently got back from Doctors 4, which was, I, I would say, a very out of the box, different teaching seminar than, you know, I've been to hundreds of them. And, you know, I thought we would kind of kick it back and forth of like what we learned you know, from that. So let me set it up, right? So, you know, we went to, to Charlottesville, UVA, to one of my former employees, you know, Robbie Fails. Yeah, exactly. And fantastic coach now. And, and you know, Mark Grace and Sean Kennedy, our, our boys, some of my best friends, put together this incredible seminar. And what a, what a great facility, UVA, that they have. And it was doctors for because there was PhDs, right? It wasn't like golf coaches, in the, in, in the general sense, right? So we had Dr. Mark Bull, as you mentioned. We had Dr. Mike K, Mike K, and then Dr. Kwan, which is one of the foremost, you know, golf scientists that probably ignited so much of the information that we've gotten over the years. You had the unfortunate task of rooming with me uh, in the house, <laughs> which we can go into. Or fortunate or unfortunate. Unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> who knows we need some nice nighttime chats man it's all good yeah exactly exactly yeah. and that, that's really what it's all about right so and i think we've probably learned more you know from from dr k when he had like the whole room and on the floor in the kitchen taking him through protocols and, and exercises which was super cool and mike k yeah, like his, that his was probably the, was yeah it's unbelievable right so so let's talk about the seminar and and like how would you describe the seminar and let's like kind of back and forth on what we took away from that? Cause I, the way I described it and I, you probably, if anybody followed me on Instagram, saw it, it basically helped us as golf coaches look at how people move from a different lens. Right. That's a, sort of the way I, I, I sort of viewed it and opened my eyes to a lot of stuff that I did not, I was not looking at. Right. It's like we look at golf swings and we, you know, every day we're looking at what the club does, we're looking at what the body does, but it's like there was so much more depth through this information that we received that I thought it was really, really cool. And and those guys did a fantastic job. What's your synopsis of your experience? Ooh, synopsis. I was filming, so hopefully I did a good job of that. Well, first of all, I, I would just like to reiterate what a fantastic presentation of the event. What a fantastic idea. Because you know, as we've discussed, I've been to a few of them. I'd stop going because too many people, not that personal one-on-one -on -one time, probably heard it already. A lot of presentations seem to be the same from event to event. So this was fantastic. This was right up my alley. This is, you know, Robbie, Mark, Sean did a great job bringing these guys together for two days of absolutely fantastic information. Again, knowing Mark quite well, recently kind of getting to know Mike, didn't know Dr. Kwan, so I was excited about that. Dr. Dale Foster chipped in there with a couple of things too on, on day one, which was fantastic. So overall, I thought it was really, really good the way they all really complemented each other. You know, uh, if you were looking at that philosophy, like it was like movement meets golf swing. And, and you know, I don't want to get into the whole debate of like, does the club move the body or the body move the club? But 
that was kind of the vibe I got from the weekend was like, you know, maybe we need to look at this in a, a more holistic kind of purview, perhaps, and how that body moves along with the club, like rather trying to dissect one or the other. So with what Mike and Mark bring to the table, you know, it's fantastic the way they can go into it, especially what Mike does go into those segments and start talking about that stuff that we were like, holy crap, like this is like different, <laughs> different lands all together. You know, anytime you get an expert in, in those fields, like it's always oh, just great to sit down. And I, I think we were very, very lucky again with how the guys set it up that there was only 27 odd people there that you got to interact. The range work was awesome, like getting down there. You know, I had Dr. Kwan show me how to swing a wedge at 250 miles an hour, which was awesome. That's probably going to be rolled back now with the new ball, but whatever. At least I can say I got there before they did that. Yeah, exactly. But no, it was, uh, I loved it. I thought it was exactly what's needed. You know, that blend of bringing those PhDs more into what we do. So them getting a chance to actually listen to us and our questions might shape what they look into more. And I think with the greatest respect to Dr. Kwan and on, I think there was a disconnect slightly, maybe up to about two or three years ago between, I think we could have something really, really special, but that was just my, like you were obviously taking notes and I know one of your guys was like doing well and Will was like right up there in the tournament at the same kind of weekend. So you're a bit distracted, but what did you think of it? No, it was cool. Yeah. I actually get to watch him play and then actually participate. No, I thought that the structure was the big thing, right? It was, and it was something that I always try to do when I did workshops was it's not only about just presenting, but then it's going and, and adding some application to it. Right. So the way they structured it was brilliant. Like they do a, a presentation, then we would go down into the bays and be able to ask questions and then watch them work with a player or really see like how how could we take some of this stuff back to our teaching tee and our lesson tee to to help our players, right? And I got to give Dr. Mark Bull a, a lesson. I don't know if you were there for that. Yeah, that was cool. And we, you know, we've interacted since. And he's like, I, it's so funny because it's like, and the first thing I told him, was, he's like, I, this is what I do. And this is what, like, the first thing you do is like, stop being the teacher and like, be the student. Yeah. And he like, it's hard goes, though, eh? right. Exactly. So he's like, exactly right. Okay. All right. You do what you do, what you want to do. And I changed them pretty quickly. And then we had texted a few times afterwards and it was just, it's just so cool that to kind of marry those ideas of like human movement and the human is really the big word that I got out of it. Right. It's like looking at, not just looking at patterns, but also looking at humans. Right. So Dr. Bull talked about how the eyes move the body. Right. And then we had a great discussion on one of my players that's, you know, visually impaired. I'm like, okay, so how do we coach this guy? Right. So it opened up a really, really cool topic of like, you know, how do we get better moving, you know, getting humans to move differently and get humans to perform. I think one of the really interesting things that was brought up, and, and you referenced it earlier, was when we were back in the house one night and, and Mike was doing his thing, which he's done for like 12, 13, 14 years. That's what he does. And you were like, yeah, I, I've never seen it in that way before. You're, you're, you're like, you're blowing my mind right now. And I was like, yeah, but dude, you got to remember, you're really good at what you do. And there's a little bit when you're talking about learning and, and that kind of learning process, you can have that ecological, and that informational process. And you got to be careful on the informational process of learning that you don't de-skill the player. That's the way you learn. But what about de-skilling the coach through their learning too? You know, so I think because you, I, I just, this is in reference to your point about bringing it home and using it for your players. It's such a cool thing to to have the conversation with you today and you know, have a conversation with Robbie from Scotland who was there, Robbie King, who was doing a great job, you know, and have that banter back and forth. What did you take from it? What did you, because that's really the essence of it to bring it back to your player, but not to think, oh man, I got to do all this stuff now because if you just got to be a little tread carefully with that. And how do you use the information just kind of on that point? Because I think that can be a little bit of a pitfall where you kind of get real excited about new stuff. Yeah, and then, then just go without kind of knowing it, so. Well, yeah, we've all done it. Again, I did the same thing. You know, I'd go to a seminar and learn something new and immediately go back and, like, you try not to make your students the guinea pig, <laughs> right? It's like... Someone you, has to be. Yeah, I know, I know. The, and as long as you can do it where <laughs> where you don't, like, completely, de like you said, de-skill the player. But, I mean, I think, you know, some of it's 
you know, and it's, there's different ways to do it. Like try it on yourself, but you got to try it on somebody. But again, you kind of got to work through it. Like I've done a lot of processing since I've been back. And, and obviously, you know, one of the big things that came out of it was, you know, I got Dr. K to, to work with one of my tour players. So literally he was in the lesson. We FaceTimed him. He was in the lesson and he basically just went through what he's seeing based on what I'm seeing. We're collaborating now, right? It's like we're kind of meshing all that stuff together what me and my players working with and working on. And he's telling me, I'm like, damn, I didn't see that. Like, that's so helpful. Like, so we're, we're integrating some of the stuff. I was doing some studying on studying dinner night. So I was kind of researching how to study better. Cause I'm, I'm off with this. I'll like, I won't, if I open up a book or watch a YouTube video that I really liked, I think it's going to be beneficial. I won't watch it. I'll turn it off until I'm in a better frame of mind that I can learn from it. So I find it really hard to like, to get information and, and not process it properly. But I was just studying about this concept and they were like, you know what a great way for learning is? Problem solving. So take the information and, and see, can you solve problems with it? And I was like, that's fantastic. So that's what I've tried to do with stuff from Dr. Spores. Okay, well, go through all my players and how would I apply that? And I found that a little bit more beneficial as we work through. But Mike's fantastic. Mike, you know, has messaged me about learning from, from golf swings too. And he, he's looking at golf courses and learning from coaches. Anytime you get someone like that who's invested on your end, man, that's so powerful. It can be really, really great. Describe what Dr. K does, like, so the listeners kind of know, like, they don't know. And I'm going to have him on the podcast. He's, we've talked. and He's a supercharged PT. Does that work? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yes. You can't find who, who, who's geographically challenged in a car. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He couldn't get us to dinner a couple times, right? human bodies. I think... Mike, if I was to phrase it from a coaching perspective, looks at the whole human movement as, as a global movement and finds where there is, and I don't like to use the term energy leaks, but I'm going to default to it because it's easier right now. But that's kind of what he kind of looks at. And he can also see how the whole body, and this is really, really important, how the whole body is interacting. It's not just one segment. So, you know, your tibia is equal to your shaft, right? The golf shaft, like your... You know, we know we did that trigger gun thing with the with the finger, the forefinger and the thumb. That's equal to your hip, you know. So everything's as we talked about, it's like it's like decorating a house. You know, like you can put a little bit of paint on the on the downstairs door, but that's gonna affect the whole value of the house as somebody would look at it outside. So everything affects everything. And I think that's what he's so good at is connecting all the dots in his own head before he even speaks. And we just don't see things like that. We don't have that perspective, mainly because we've been kind of brought up to kind of look at segments. So when we go internal, external, and we go, okay, my, my hip is internal. He's like, no, 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 the whole the whole structure is internal versus external. And you're like, okay, dude, where, where are you going with this? So I, I think his magic is in movement and analyzing movement as a whole in the person and looking at it in, in this very good phase of, capturing energy throughout moments and throughout the whole swing and when you look at it in that sphere when you start looking at it rather than okay well that's just that point there that structure that segment is shouldn't be like that well when you start looking at it, it's like okay well when that's like that then this reacts like that and then there's a common place between the two i think that's when you start seeing some of that stuff that he does i might not be doing him justice i apologize if i'm not but he told me he wouldn't come back if I was back next year. So I'm cool. I'm cool. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the joke. Uh, but no, I think no, that was that was well great. said. Yeah, he's he's yeah. so good. I call him the wizard now, right? So I'm, I'm officially hashtag the wizard. But yeah, it's 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 just again, you've got to have you kind of experts in each part mm-hmm. when we're dealing with with high profile and like really good athletes, right? I mean, because it's my guy had an, a former injury, okay, and he's been to so many different people and couldn't really get a straight answer of like what's causing the pain. Right. And he's kind of coming out of it and he's playing and he's back on the corn Ferry tour. And I think he'll be on PGA tour if he stays healthy, but it was just nice. It was just nice for a guy like that to go, Oh, I mean, he saw it right away. You know, he did a couple of tests on it. We literally did it on FaceTime when I was in Charlottesville and like, okay, that makes sense. So I'm learning because I got to know I'm the guy that's like with him all the time. Right. He's not going to be with him, but 
so so nice, you know, for him to take the time to do that. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to explain, like what was going through my mind when I'm like watching this guy. Is it, is it kind of like you old know, school where just, he kind of blanks out, and then he wakes back up like two minutes later? And you're like, what just happened? Yeah, it was like the it was like the good doctor, right? He's like he just goes, you know, yeah. Sean just kind of goes into another, another dimension and like, all right, what's going on? And he's like, oh, there it is. So he's got you know on the floor, and he's like, oh, yeah, just do this, this, and this, and like all of a sudden, like your takeaway changes. <laughs> You know, or like what you've been trying to do changes, but it was, he was a lot about breathing. I thought was, which was really interesting, right? Making sure that we get breath into the system, that piece. And he talked a lot of it. He talked about the guts and then he was a very, he was an expert in the sacrum, <laughs> right? In the butthole. You mutated sacrum. <laughs> Muti, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but I mean, I thought it, it was really cool. And again, we're talking about doctors four here. It was really cool. Like you said, how they all sort of, I call them callbacks, right? It's, it, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a comedian doing a bit and like calling back a former joke. But Kay would say, yeah, you know, he would refer to Dr. To Dr. Bull a lot. Dr. Bull would refer to Dr. K a lot. And then Dr. Kwan, right? So there were so many things that sort of overlapped, I think, with all their presentations, which were, which was fantastic. I think it even starts to overlap with your own education. And that's when it really starts. You start, although we're from two different, not walks, but two different professions, say golf coach versus PT. You know, I've been doing stuff with NeuroPeak Pro and the breathing and stuff like that. And so then you start getting these crosswalks that go across each other. And that's the really cool stuff. Then you start kind of getting excited about it. And then with Mike, uh, you mentioned the takeaway stuff there. I, I, I should have mentioned that, like that Mike is, you know, very insistent on that first move, that first kind of couple of feet, what's happening there. How is the structure at the setup, you know, and having this massive influence on everything else that follows, you know, and, you know, I don't know about you, but that kind of makes sense to me. And what windows do we have for change as a coach? Where, where's your windows set up and, and backswing mainly, really? I'm a big backswing guy. I get the fact that like, okay, it's, you know, transition, downswing, impact, all this stuff happens, but it happens really, really fast. I can affect a lot of those changes with how, how the club moves back, right? And that, that kind of overlaps with what Dr. Kwan talks about, right? It's like walking, right? So it's interesting, you know, kind of going back, and you know, I'm just riffing here a little bit, but going back to like when Robbie first went to level one Dr. Kwan, which is four or five years ago, and you brought it back. And I was like, man, that's that's really cool. But like, how do you really teach that? Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, we're swinging the ropes. And now I find myself, I'm doing so much of that, like in a smaller scope of all the pieces that he's basically brought forward into the way he trains players and the way he's sort of studied ground reaction forces and, you know, sequencing and all the stuff that I think is really important in good swings. It all kind of comes full circle, but it's, a again, back to like, how do you apply that to a golf lesson, right? It's like finding your own style, finding your your timing of how to impart some of these things. When you find somebody that's like stuck in the mud and is just taking the club away with their hands, like you start to, you know, oh, let's go with a little bit of Dr. Kwan stuff, right? Let's, let's get them moving their feet around. Let's put some energy in the club. I think it's so cool. And that's the first thing, you know, I've kind of known his stuff for a minute, but to see it live, I thought was super cool. And and he was, he was really funny. He was a great yeah, presenter. He's such a character, man. Right? Yeah. It's like yeah. so many, like it's so many great jokes and like he had the, he had the crowd were kind of rolling, but yeah. And watching him do his drills and stuff was like really, really helpful. I thought. That's such a cool way to learn it is doing what you did with Mike. Student consults. Cause you really get like in the coal face of it, you see, yeah. As much as studying and books and all those things are great video certification courses. You have an opportunity to get whoever you're working with or mentoring under. You got an opportunity to pay them some money, get them on the line and get them to look at your golfers. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. It's the best money you'll ever invest. 100 percent. I can't I can't strongly emphasize that enough. So if we kind of go down the list again, we're sort of. At, at this point, we're co-hosting. And, is this the guru takes from Doctors Four? Yeah, this is my this is my takes. This is like don't the, room I with just, Steve. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> obviously. So, all right, so before we start, you had the one disappointing thing was like that Doctor Bull sleeps like all the time, right? Like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't. Well, stay dude, up he late. was on jet lag. To be fair, I know, I know, and, and he was coming from London. He but was you got to, at six thirty in the morning. Okay, that's what I'm leading into. Like you got to actually work out with him like talk about that because it's not the 
typical workout that we would think. Like, tell us about your morning. I think we were up at 6.30, which is generally the time I get up anyway, so we're all good. <laughs> a little bit a little bit earlier than what I normally do at 7. But yeah, we went for a walk. He goes, like his, his phrase is, you know, have a play around. Okay, so I don't know what that means, but okay, cool. It, it's Dr. Bull, one of the smartest guys in the world. If he tells you, like, you've got to be up at 7 to go for a walk, like, you're going to be up there, right? So got out of bed. Let's kick it. Go for a little walk. We find this local playground. I'm like, cool. And he goes, all right, so, you know, we're just going to, like, move around. And I'm like, okay. So there's nothing more said, really, from him after that. Takes off the shoes and socks and starts going into this Edo Portal workout regime, which, like, involves some handstands, bear crawls, side bear crawls. It's the best way I can describe it. So, again, as I said, like, a lot of time for Mark. And I'm kind of standing there, like, you know, do I just wait? <laughs> or should, should I get involved here? So, you know, being... Being the intrepid uh, explorer that I am, take off the shoes and socks. And I was like, okay. So I started doing a couple of bear crawls, a bit of a stretch, but whatever. And then Mark rolls into a few handstands. So I'm like, all right, why not? I swear to God, I couldn't even get halfway off the ground. <laughs> so <laughs> I did a handstand. It was just embarrassing to the extent that I wonder whether I was taking away from his experience that morning. But again, this rolls back to where we're all having a laugh and a joke about it. It rolls back to the British Olympic cycling team. And that story where, you know, forgive me if I get the years and the dates wrong, but for a long time, they were massively unsuccessful because they were riding around on bikes all day. And then they brought in a layer of turf and put it in the middle of the training stadium and got them to walk around on the turf for an hour each day. And they went on to dominate the next two Olympics. So as much as we kind of laugh and joke, it's really, I think you study people subconsciously that are really great at things. And then you take it and you take it with a pinch of salt, obviously. But he was yeah, obviously very, very nice to let me come along in that morning. And really interesting to see how people like that start their day, how they get programmed, how they get primed. You know, you hear about that quite a lot, like with Tony and Jim would kind of talk about that a lot. Tony Robbins, Jim Rome. Really interesting. And then we just had a like, really, really cool conversation, which will kind of stay between me and him. But just really, really cool. Great opportunity to spend some time with, with someone like that, you know. Obviously, pales in significance to spending time with you, I did, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the, the two the two takeaways there is something I learned from him mm-hmm. in our first interview, because I've had him on the podcast twice. Was yeah, he's amazing. The fact, Those two podcasts are amazing. Is the fact that he's like, the skin is your shoes, right? So take your shoes off. And and I don't know if you caught if you caught a tweet that I, I, saw I think maybe I, maybe I put it on, on Instagram. Yeah, may, yeah the, the Instagram post that I put the other day, which made me really think, because I'm I'm very obsessed about looking at people's feet and how they move, and then ultimately their footwear. And Doctor Bull mentioned that during the seminar, but he's like, I'm not going to get into that because it'd be a whole nother seminar. But it's a big thing. But his thing was not the feet, but then how the eyes connect the way we move, right? The vision, right? So that's that was my first. My I'm kind of go through my list here. It was like eyes drive human behavior. Right. Sensory feedback is, is very, very important. And I've shared that with a lot of my folks here, especially when I teach in my teaching bay, whether it's sunny or there's a shadow or the lighting is, you know, whatever it is, is like, do you really need sunglasses? Like, I'm really asking a lot of questions about their vision because I, you know, really understand like how that drives human movement. And he says the feet follow the eyes. And then he said half of our brain is based on visual movement. Like, think about that. Right. So that's where I think it, it sort of guides us back to like, what questions are we asking our players? Not just about what we're seeing, but like, what are they seeing that is creating some of the movement and the human movement that we're seeing, you know, in front of us. And then it's going down the list here is why and how controls most things, right? So that goes back to the interview process of like the why, which I'm really big on. Why are we doing it? And he says the head will always follow the load or the dominant side. And he showed that really cool video about you know, with Usain Bolt running and how his head moved like from side to side, you know, and you, and here we are trying to keep our head still when we swing a golf club. It's not, it's not really possible. It's not advantageous and efficient in all cases. And then he said, true separation happens between the upper and lower thorax and the diaphragm. And then the way the neck is positioned is a big, big deal, right? So it's like all these little things we're seeing from 
not just how people move is like just how they stand, right? It's like when they walk into your building or they walk onto your lesson tee, you know, how observant are we as coaches about how they walk and then like how their joints are lined up and then how they are standing and how they are positioning themselves like could tell us so much and probably save a lot of us time. Not that I don't think screening is very important because I think it is, but there's a lot of screening you can do without even getting people to do stuff. And then like we talked about, eyewear was a big deal. He said that eyewear can be a huge constraint. I thought that was very interesting, right? Because we're, you know, I think it, and I told, I actually told a student today when I was giving a lesson, I said, I said, look, your sunglasses are great. Like in between shots, I think it's great because you're protecting your eyes. But once you get ready to hit a shot, I would prefer that you take them off because I think you're going to move differently with them off. It also has that effect on the circadian rhythm of your body. So you, there you go. your body. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> Again, learn from, from a bullism. Prep. There you go. Let's go. So, yes, yeah, there's circadian rhythm. So it dulls down what your eyes are. So your eyes basically think it's either earlier or later than it actually is. And so it changes your body composition to match up for it. So if you if your eyes think it's darker, they presume that it's later at night and you're getting ready and primed to go to sleep. So that changes how your body is. So that's a, that's another reason I, I've heard it mentioned that before about the eyes. But what's really interesting is, and this is not a disdain on anybody, is if I'm a PGA coach going through a course right now, like an assistant and, and learning about golf swing, how many of those things that you mentioned do you think I get told? Zero. I think I'm not going to go on any pathway here. It was just an interesting observation because I, I agree to you 100%. I'm all in. Like I have a guy who's an arborist, cuts down trees for a living, leans on his left post all day long uses the right side to move whatever he's using, whatever object he's using. He can't rotate through that left side when he gets a golf club in his hand because that's what he's done for 13 years. No matter what you do, you know what I mean? So it's 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 that stuff that you're talking about. It's the thinking outside the box. It's it's the it's the low hanging fruit of the human being. You know, and, and the golf swing I say I think it's Mark that said this, but golf swings are not that complicated. It's the human being. Like in a really good way. Like I, I'm going to jump back to what I kind of took because I forgot this out of the two weeks is this, this stuff, right? We talk about, it's nearly like as coaches, we default to trying to make it easier. And that's a, that's a noble pursuit. And I think we should be trying to make it easier for the student. Absolutely. But this shit is not meant to be easy. No, it's not simple. It's, it's meant to be complicated. It's meant to be tricky. It's meant to be a little bit messy and that's okay. As long as we are arming ourselves with the tools to deal with that, but we got to be okay with that. We got to be okay. And I think you, you, I think you'll. If we went back to a video of Mark talking, I think you'll hear him say this over the two days. I'm okay with not having a great session. Like sometimes I'm driving home and I'm like, that was awful, you know. But as long as you're doing your best, but human beings are just messy, man. And so if you're doing what you just said, that your takeaways there are just like. Like, go play that back for anybody who wants to listen to this podcast again. Like, that's just, that's it in a nutshell, what you just talked about there with the eyes, the feet, you know, your perception, like the, the head, how it really, you know, all those things are just so, so important. I, I just, I can't preach that enough. And it, again, it goes back to your perception of how you see things. Like, I think Sean talks, Sean Foley talks about like saving himself from player, from saving his players from his preferences. I don't agree with that completely. I think you need to be subconsciously using your experiences but i kind of get what he's trying to say with that yeah again the tight rope that we walk 100 uh, percent. but it's okay as, to as fail coaches yeah absolutely yeah and that, that's that's where we that's where we learn i think and that's like going to your point there i posted a quote on instagram the other day it was yeah willingly happily struggle that's golf and struggling the right way makes you smarter right and it was daniel Coyle, but it just it kind of throws it back on the student right it's like I sort of was conditioned as a young coach and then coming up is like, I didn't want to have a bad lesson. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But it's going to happen, right? There's, there's times where you leave the lesson. You're like, I should have done this. I should have done that. And you reflect on it and you like want to do something different, but it's also on the student to go. And I always tell people when they come in to the dojo, you're like, oh, I'm just, you know, I, I feel like I'm doing the right things. And I'm struggling. I'm like, enjoy that. Right. You're in the suck right now. Okay. Like you've got to be able to embrace the suck. Because this is where, you, if you're really passionate about getting better, this is where you need to be, okay? It's not going to be easy, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's tough to get our logical brains, our monkey brains around that, but 
that's where that's where learning happens, right? I mean, that's no different from coaches, but it's like a two way street. All right, so so take us through what you because I know you spent a lot more time with Doctor Bull, even other than the seminar. But like, take us through what you took from Doctor Bull, and then give us some bullisms aside from like doing handstands and the yeah, yeah, yeah. School. Again, it's it's just the awareness of how to look at things differently, and, and I don't mean just looking at things. I mean how you interact with the with the person with the human being. So. You know, you would have seen, you know, when, when Mark talked about, you know, voice versus vision, you know, and he goes, OK, well, hold your thumb up to your mouth. And he put his thumb on the side of his cheek and everybody puts the thumb on the side of a cheek to replicate it. So he has all these, which I really love. He has all these points to make, but he has some nice processes to illustrate and kind of really not prove them, but kind of demonstrate them, which as a human being gives mass credence. So if I tell you something If I show you something, now it gets a little bit different. I always remember one of the first ones I kind of really saw from him was about the toes and the feet. And, you know, okay, well, if you stand there and curl your toes up, now jump as high as you can. Ain't not a lot happening. Put your toes back on the ground now, jump. Okay. So now now I don't have to tell you about your toes being like the the trampoline of of the lift, okay, to jump. I've just proven it by getting you to try and do a task, you know, and the focus one we talked about, the trick I referred to during the two day seminar, like balancing the golf club that you have to actually do. I apologize about that. Yeah, yeah you that's know? all right. So stuff like that, I think is absolutely fantastic. Like in terms of like the bullisms, like I've got them over on my board here. When you're talking about it, like there, there's always a why. So, you know, why does the person do what they do? You know, there's, there's always a reason. So you got to look at that and you got to discuss it with the player and kind of get their perception, you know, and that's really, I think, he is magnificently fantastic, intellectually amazing at looking at movement, but he's also really, really damn good at looking at the human being. And I, I think that's a really, really impressive kind of combination to have. So when I get a chance to spend two days with him, to be honest with you, it's it's just kind of that's why we have two ears. I tried as much listen as much as possible and kind of gleam and the helical stuff that we talked about in terms of the helix and the system wide versus narrow pelvis. You know, I, I, I'd been exposed to that before and seen that before. But we talked about when we we're out in the range and, you know, we were talking about creating movement and, you know, creating movement individual without actually touching them, you know, and, and the way he would like move his hand towards my hip and just kind of ask a question, you know, okay, don't let your hip hit my hand. And then he'd move his hand towards your hip and you have to move your hip to get away. So it's it's those little things that you keep kind of coming back to, you know, that that he's just really, really good at. And I think, as I said, it's it's if you can... And he'll say this, it, it, it's what questions we ask, right? The questions are important, right? So I think he asked some great questions. Even you know yourself being around him, when you ask him a question, there's a high percentage chance you're going to get a question back, Do you know, to, to kind of rephrase and kind of fling it back at you a little bit like a boomerang. But he does that in a really, really good way because he wants you to kind of do a little bit of learning. You know what I mean? It's, it's For sure. There's no cheap answers. It was cool having him at dinner, you know, at the, when we were having dinner that one night. But, you know, he was tired. He was just like, I wish I was a little more awake. He kept apologizing. I'm like, dude, it's fine. <laughs> like, it's, I know you've, you've, you know, come a long way. But, yeah, I just, told, I was just kind of sharing with him what I had learned, you know, just from our interactions. It's like, you know, just simple questions like, how can I help? It's probably for the young coaches out there, or just coaches in general. It's like asking open-ended questions, I think, is probably the key phrase there, right? And how can I help is a really good one. And then kind of shut up and go, let's see what comes out of that when the student walks into the team, right? Again, it's like, you don't know, like, and a lot of times they don't know what to say, but it, it opens the door. It's not like, it's not a very evasive question where you're attacking somebody for other reasons of improficiency or whatever. It's just like, okay, how can I help you? Right. And it basically, it, it makes us more vulnerable to get a better answer I guess, for lack of a better term. Oh, absolutely. And it's not about what I want to teach. It's what about what you want to learn, which is another fantastic one that I, in all honesty, I, I use the one that you just referenced and that one in every single lesson I do, if I'm meeting a person for the first time. Number one, how can I help you today in the best possible way? And then when we start talking, I'm like, listen, this isn't about what I want to, you know, want to teach you. This is about what you want to learn. You know, and, and I think they're probably two of my, favorite ones and then need an allowance so everything you see a player move in a certain way there's there's a need for them to move like that and it's just finding that need and a lot of that time that reverts back to perception and then that reverts back to the opening question you know of like okay well if you can find out their history of what they've been exposed to before i think one of the other phrases he'll use an awful lot is 
there's two main reasons why we do what we do. It's memory and anatomy. So the memory of all those influences, coaches, people, social media, YouTube, et cetera, playing partners, anatomy, what you kind of can't do with your body. And if you throw those two things into the melting pot, that's normally what you're going to get in front of you as a coach. And it's your job as much as possible to decipher what's influenced by which. And if you can, everything becomes an awful lot clearer in terms of what you can do with that player in front of you. Because I think we'll both agree what you're really fantastic with in doing that is, is recognizing all those things and not asking a player to do something they physically can't do. Because that just leads to frustration on both parts. Yeah, that's just, again, reading the student a little bit, right? So whatever your screening process is. Yeah. And that's me like moving people around. I'm a big mover and then asking questions of how do you feel? <laughs> right. What's, does this it's hurt? Though. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's really important. If I, one word of advice to any, like I said, it again, another guy I had today and I'm like, he was like, oh, and he was about to say something, you know, when they're about to say something and he, and he stopped. And I, was, I went over to him and I was like, tell me everything. I was like, if you feel like you're going to fall over, you tell me you're going to fall. If you feel like you've never been this nervous in your entire life, you tell me that. And he goes, okay. And then he blurted out like five minutes of stuff. And I'm like, cool. Now I know. Now I can help you. So my advice to any student, any pupil, any coach is like, just, this is your window, man. That hour of or hour and a half, two hours, give it all, like give it up. Because yeah. if you don't, we're going to rightly or wrong as a human being pursue or presume what we see is what's happening. And if you're thinking about something over that golf ball, like a guy today where he's like, oh, I was always told to take it low and slow. And I'm like seeing a low and slow action. What I'm going to say is I'm going to go, hey, I'd like you to pick it up or, you know, whatever phrase you're going to use. But if I talk to him and understand that that's actually a perception of his, that he has to do that, then I can just remove that perception rather than asking him to do something on top of it. And that's a really, really powerful way to look at things. What we have as a motor pattern, as a default in terms of swing the golf club, will never really change. It's always there. We're just kind of adding little layers on top of it to kind of improve it a little bit. You've hung around Mark a little bit. You've obviously had him on the podcast. And yeah, did you kind of get anything new from the two days, or did you kind of confirm anything that you already believed, or anything kind of spring up that you were like, "Oh shit, man, that's that's interesting. I like that." Not really. Like he he was kind of like I said, I would have loved to have spent a little more time away from the site with him. You know, we didn't get a whole lot of conversation with him, like at the house, which which would have been super interesting. I know him and Sean talked about music and some stuff that I just would love to get his perspective on things from like a real world perspective as as opposed to like presentation wise. Nothing like super new, but I think there's opportunity because we do have a relationship and if he's listening to the podcast, (laughs) we'll be, we'll be talking more because I think he's kind of unofficially hired me as his swing coach. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So like, that's a whole nother opportunity in itself, right? Like I, to like teach that guy, like yeah. imagine how much you would learn as a coach just to like, cause he goes, he said, I can't have to like get the text back. He's like, I enjoy learning how you're going to learn how I move <laughs> or something like that. I was like, you want shit. <laughs> I just, you know, another one of those like sort of, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I just got fired before I got hired. Right. So it's, it's yeah. like, all right. No, I told him like, all right, I'm down for the challenge. Like uh, I'm, I'm ready to dive in. Cause that's again, going to make me better. And I know I can help him. So it's kind of like, again, our two worlds colliding. It's like we talked about with like Dr. K, like I can't wait to like for my next conversation with that guy or like what, you know, have him help one of my players because it's just a whole nother world opening up for us as coaches to get better. Right. And it's like, we got to give, you know, Robbie, Sean and Mark all the credit for like bringing all these people together. Oh yeah, man. It's not easy to organize something like that. And, no. you know, I think the great thing about those guys is, you know, I talked to you before about this, about going to Arizona for the top 100 and the experience there and, you know, kind of going, a little bit for validation, okay? That humanistic kind of nature of me wanting to like somebody's tell me that I'm doing a good job. We all have that little time. And kind of being there and kind of going, you know what? Kind of don't really need it. But then leaving and, and you know the way like, you know, you get you lose something, you get something. And like when I left and I looked at my circle of people 
who I trust and who I look for mentorship and guidance from, like being you, Robbie, Mark, Mark Bull, Mike K. Hey, he's still he's still not in the circle yet. He's going to have to do something major to get in. <laughs> <laughs> Make them work harder to get in the circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get to the location quicker. <laughs> yeah. All he did is drive in circles. He should be at the center of it. Only joke, Mike. But going kind of back to what you said, like it, it's a really interesting thing because you look at Robbie and Mark, and I'm like, man, they did such a great thing in this like seminar. And I'm nearly thinking like it's like they were reading my mind, and I'm like, shit, like we're all in the same kind of vein. We're all looking for that same thing. I think we're all on really, really good path. And that's my point. Like it's like. This is what's needed. You know, I mean, Robbie's a smart dude. Mark's a smart guy. Mark, I, you know, like all those guys are, are doing some really, really great stuff. Like, and Sean's doing great stuff. And they know that this was required. You know, he, there was no point to us sitting in a classroom for five hours listening to these dudes. You know, you got to get out there in the range. You got to test it out. You got to kind of work out, question people. And I think it was just, if I ever go to a seminar again, that should be what it should look like in my mind. So I have so much gratitude for that. All right. So let's, let's talk about your podcast and then we'll, we'll get back into some teaching stuff too. But I want to, I want to definitely touch on this because I get the question of like, what have you learned from doing the podcast? But I mean, the, the initial question is like, why did you start a podcast? Right. What, what, what felt you, what led you to like start a podcast? Cause I think you're doing a great job. I listen to your podcast every time, you know, an episode comes out and I was going to text you and give you some feedback yeah, absolutely. But just me. Talk us through the process of, you know, if somebody's wanting to start, you know, why did you do it? I think there was a, it was a mixture of reasons. One was just do anything you can in your passion. So if you listen to anything, Gary V, any, anything, just do it, right? You know, whatever it might be, just revolve around your passion, just go and do it. What I kind of found was in my travels, whether it be actual geographically changed location or talking to people, I'll come across all this great information that was blowing my mind, right? Like I talked to Mark or, you know, I talked to you or I talked to, you know, Sean or Kauxi, whatever it was. And they would tell me something. I'm like, man, that's amazing. I can't believe that. I'm going to study that. I'm going to learn that. And then I was like, you know what? I don't think a lot of people know this stuff, right? Golfers and coaches. And I'm like, let's get on a podcast. Let's get the people that I've encountered and had talk to and learn from and i'm going to guide them to provide the same information that i gleaned from them and that was the kind of origin of it and then you have to come up with something a little bit different in terms of what you want to do and i'm like all right well how about i split it just do a 50 50 so give them the opportunity whoever comes on to talk to your club golfer how can we help them and then the second part was okay if a coach is listening what can the coach learn from this person either career development wise or actually information wise and that was really the origin of it was just kind of something to do more in golf. So to get like obviously brand development, you can kind of phrase it that if you want. Sure. Obviously wanted to be famous like golf guru. I knew it was a, <laughs> it was a big achievement, but I was, I was going to, it, it was you and Paige sporadic. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that was the inspiration, but yeah, no, it, like obviously I'd seen what you did and, Again, a little bit of it. I said it to, I said you to start. I don't mind telling the story. Like, you know, obviously I live in Ireland and I'm from Ireland and my parents came over every so often and they hadn't been over in a while because of COVID and they were here last year and, you know, it's, it's great seeing them, but obviously they're getting older. So as, as they leave, it's an emotional time. The day they left, I was over at their house and it was like late at night. It was like 7.30 or something. And I had to say goodbye to them. They were leaving the next day and obviously I was upset, like, you know, driving home. And I had on your podcast and it was the one you had Jeff Smith on. And, you know, I'm just driving along, like just listening to it as you go. And it was like, oh, and I got a question here from Steve, young Padawan from, I'm like booked up immediately. And then Jeff said something nice about me and it changed my whole night. You know what I mean? And I'm like, you know, I only told you that story a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, I, I think if you can, you're not trying to have that effect on people, but I think if you can bring a little bit of life or a light or a little bit of enjoyment into someone's life i think like it's a, it's a massive massive opportunity now, if you are well-meaning and you can like spread that a little bit i said to you you've before we even really started talking and knowing each other you have no idea the impact you made in my life you know in terms of listening to your stuff in terms of you creating that platform so you creating that platform created a path for me and i think that's a really really powerful thing for someone to do 
So if I was like, okay, well, maybe if I get Mike K on and Mike K says something about energy and wave propagation and somebody's listening and they go, shit, man, I'd like to know more about that. And they go and study it. And then they have a student the next day who's whatever, internally, double externally rotated with mutated sacrums. They might have a better idea of <laughs> and their of what's going moving on. the wrong so, way. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think there was any real like, oh yeah, I want to do it for this reason. I think it was just to be involved more in golf to do something more than I was doing. Obviously, you know, where I'm located, I want to get my name out there. And then spreading the information that I got, because I thought it was so fantastic that everybody wanted to hear it. You know, it's nearly like you're driving in, in the car and your your favorite tune comes on, you wind down the window and turn the volume up because you want everybody else to hear how good a song you're listening to is. And then just that secondary part was, I know what a difference you made in my life, in my career, during the winter time when we wouldn't have any golf coaching here in Canada that I'd be driving to the golf club where it's snowing and listen to your podcast every morning like whether you had Dana or wh- whoever you had on Sean or everything those guys and Butch and you know going like man like this this guy has given me an avenue a pathway to information that I would not have no no way in world at that stage I was getting talking to Dana or getting talking to Butch or any of those guys you know so I think that was really really important to try and pay a little bit of that back ever so ever so gradually ever so smallly and now it's given me the opportunity now to kind of do a little bit of with the kind of new thing that we're going to try and do on it the new breed stuff is get some unknown coaches on there and and give them the platform for half an hour not that my platform is huge but a little bit of a platform maybe to to kind of introduce themselves a little bit to an audience they might not have got before i can't tell you how much that means to me like the story you told me when we were in closed doors about that and you know, I told you like every, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work, but I mean, it's still, it's a toil of love, you know, because we, we wouldn't keep doing it if we didn't enjoy again, sharing. And then for you to like, and I always say it's, it's, an, you just say that I'm just like sharing stuff, but like, it's, I feel like it's our obligation, right? People pass it down to me and I'm going to pass it on to, to guys like you that I know it means a lot to, and then you're going to carry the torch. So I just can't tell you how much that means to me with the, your words. And I'm not drunk either. I know. You're completely sober, <laughs> which makes me feel even better. You'd be so great to me, like, in, in all honesty, not that, you know, you mentioned the feedback there. We kind of did it a bit of tongue in cheek. But, you know, it takes a lot from you to go out of your way. I'm always surprised, like, not maybe not surprised is the wrong word, in debt, indebted to you when I get a text from you after an episode and you go, Hey, that was really good. Or, Hey, blah, blah, blah. You know, you could have like, that means a lot to me, like, because, you know, you're taking the time, like, and I know it automatically downloads, so it's good. But, um, but the fact that you, <laughs> you take the time and, and, you know, a little bit of critique, like where we, you know, you got to be okay with being told you're not doing something like, or you could be doing something better. But again, it just goes back to paying it back a little bit and just yeah. fuck, like just being a nice human being, man. You know what I mean? And, recognizing somebody, you know, you very, very gracefully talked about Dana one night when we were at dinner and what a, what a massive influence she had on you, you know, and I could hear in your, in your voice how much she meant to you. And it's like, you know, and not to get too, but I'm sure she'd be very proud, like the way you're kind of pushing that forward and, and, and helping me, you know, even we did mention something at that dinner table. I mentioned something about a guy I had worked with and we said something, you were like, don't ever do that. And I was like, no, but I was like, don't, don't ever do that. And I'm like, okay, understood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it was cool. Like, we got to help, I won't mention the name, but one of the other guys living in the house, right? We got to to mentor him a little bit and give him advice on what we thought. He was he was kind of new to coaching and, and again, open to like, all right, what do you guys think? And I, yeah. hopefully he was appreciative of that if he's listening to this. <laughs> I ask you, like, was it too hard on him? Like, you know, it was perfect. Like, I don't know. I'm just I'm just being me. But, you know, again, I kind of treat people the way I would want to be treated as far as, like, this is what I was missing in those first yeah. callback, missing the first eight years of my career. I would have loved to have somebody like you or me, like, just giving them some advice on whatever we were looking at videos you know that's the cool stuff stuff right like hey what would you do with this player oh this is what i see like it's it's again just different and not the same we're we're right but it's definitely it's definitely helpful uh, it's like changing somebody's perspective on 
whatever it is, right? We're just kind of pushing along, but it's obligation, man. I think it's like, that's, that's the way I look at it. It's like, you know, just like Martin Hall told me years ago, I told you that story. He's like, now it's time. It's like, pass it on. Like, just now it's your turn. I'm like, shit. <laughs> that's like, that's a big burden. I, I got it. But, <laughs> yeah. right? Now it's on you. Like, I'm done. I'm like, I'm probably going to retire tomorrow. But it's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's all of that. That's the cool stuff, right? I mean, that's the cool stuff that we, that we get to, to sort of go through and, yeah, and it's 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 putting yourself out there too. Like, you know, I, I'll always like I remember talking to I won't say who it was and before I left Virginia and they were like, Again, this is not they gave me a compliment, let's say, let's just leave it at that. And I was like I deferred it immediately to my influences. You know, and I think that's really, really important, like that, yes. you know, how you give credit. Yeah, like you gotta give respect. I I remember talking to Mark about his membership thing and I was like, I'm gonna join that elite membership tier because I want to talk to you every month and I want to ask you about my players. And he goes, oh, just give me a call every so often. I'm like, no, I'm going to pay. Because at some point in time, you paid for a course to go get educated. And it's a respect thing now. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, so, you know, I think that's really, really important when you look at how we kind of learn and how we progress through. But again, I'll always, if, if a young coach or any coach asks me, hey, I want to be here. What do you think? I'll be honest and straight up because there's no point in really, you know, dancing around the issues if they need if they need the honest truth to improve. For sure. So what what's what's your I know I know you you were you were off the podcast for a while. What do you think skill wise since you started? What what's your best or your most skill development in terms of the podcasting? Have you felt you got better with the presentation, with the interaction with the people? Where do you think you've developed and, and do you feel that that has any correlation into your like live everyday teaching? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely the art of interviewing, crafting and asking better questions, right? Is the bet is the big thing. And hundred percent that goes into like every, my everyday life. Like the way I craft questions to my students is critical, right? It's like Jim Rohn says, don't be lazy in language. Yeah. You only have one opportunity to ask that question the right way, right? So that's been the biggest thing. And I pay attention, like, when I listen to other podcasts, because we talked about it when we were rooming together, it's like, what podcasts are you listening to that aren't golf? And you're like, not too many. I'm like, you got to listen to this, 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 and this. But it's not just for the information. It's also for how they ask questions to their guests. Yeah. Right. So that goes way back. Yeah. That goes way back to like when I was listening to the CDs. It's not about me listening to a Jim Rohn presentation that he's giving in front of thousands of people or an auditorium. It's like the delivery. It's like, how is he, how is he saying that? And like the pauses and the, the little anecdotes and the, the humor and all that, I think is something that is developed over time. But I mean, I love listening to David Letterman. I love listening to Jimmy Fallon or whoever, like just doing, you know, interviews with other people and going, okay, that was a cool question. I'm going to write that down. You know, Tim Ferriss obviously is a big reason why I, why I started this podcast, like a lot of his questions that I've adopted, but it's just all that, right? It's just like teaching stuff, but it's all encompassing of like, how do you get the most out of a lesson? And I think the interview process is, critical people come to shadow me and like the meat is important but getting the information like you said before is like give it all to me right like how do you how do you draw that out of the student is a skill okay and now it's our body language like we're looking at their body language it's our body language so i'm having a bad day something's bothering me and i'm all closed off they come in and i'm like and i'm grumpy how much are they going to give me? None, nothing, right? It's like it's up, to, yeah. it's up to us, up to us to kind of like pro- project that energy to, and I try to like be on, you know, I'm on, I feel like I'm on stage all day and all night, but that's important to me that I, that I bring that kind of energy to every, every player. Yeah, it's all of that, right? So it's yeah. like, but that's probably the biggest thing aside from the editing and learning how yeah. to be a producer and a 
engineer mixer. or whatever the heck. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mixer, yeah. I've learned yeah. a lot about sound and like all this other yeah. stuff and microphones and like all that stuff I had to figure out on my own. Nobody told me how to do it. I just kind of like figured it out as I went along and made a lot of mistakes. Like you, li- you listen to the first few podcasts, or, you know, the audio is terrible. But I didn't know. And, you know, and I asked questions. I reached out to people. I reached out to some producers for other podcasts that you would never have heard of. And they were really nice enough to email me back with answers. Stuff like that. So uh, that's a question I was about to ask you. Okay. Okay. So give me your feedback on what have you learned or what skills, new skills have you developed from doing the podcast? Fluidity of thinking. So what's transpired in like my kind of routine to get people on the podcast was I felt that I think for the first couple, because I knew them very well, I messaged through Instagram and then it started getting outside my my intimate circle a little bit. So I was like, okay, I got to be a bit more professional. So what I'll do is I'll create questions and I'll, I'll actually write the questions down and I'll send it to them via email, explain what the podcast is about. And, and what I found for the last four was they didn't really want questions, but the previous ones, what started happening was I'd have like, you know, this list of questions perfectly laid out. And then the first four or five times I would do that, I would go, okay, first question, blah, 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 blah. And they would start answering the question. And I'd be like looking at the second question, ready to go. As soon as they finish answering that first, I wasn't really paying attention to what they were saying. And I would listen back to a couple of the podcasts and they would say some really, really potentially great things that if I'd been listening to them and, and went, and okay, let's go that, let's go that path. That would have been a really great opportunity to talk about that. And I didn't because I was so intent on getting through my questions. So I learned to be a little bit more fluid with that and a little bit more adaptable. I think that's a, that's a skill you have to develop. And, and yes. you know, having the, the confidence, so to speak, or, you know, the competence maybe to like hang on and just let them talk and let it go wherever it goes. You know, you have your list of questions that you'd like to ask them, obviously, but they're the guest. People aren't paying or are not paying, but people aren't listening really to you more about the person you have on. So that's why, like, I think in terms of that skill, that development, it was really looking at that and then getting the thing I struggled with early on was the confidence to engage maybe in the dialogue. And that's maybe why I didn't do it. Cause I was like, Oh man, if I get tripped up on something here, this is like, like, you know, okay, we're recording it. So I could obviously edit it out, but I didn't feel like, and I think I told you this, I didn't feel like I could hold my own technically wise at the start. And I was worried about that. And that was a very conscious, okay, I'm going to hold it here and I'm going to just answer my safe questions and just guide them in this direction. And then when I started, I think Dana's interview was the first one where I kind of let loose and let the handbrake off a little bit. And I was like, oh, just ask your shit. You know what I mean? Go for it. What's the worst that can happen? And that was the first one I started going, okay, well, I'm just going to go and do my thing. So I think to totally answer your question, it was the adaptability of of what I wanted to ask and the confidence to let the podcast flow where it went and to ask my questions too, I think was really, they're the skills I think I've developed over the last while. Yeah, that's really well put. And I think we, I think we shared this together a few weeks ago when we were talking with, I've gotten to where, I don't want to give away all my secrets, but. I've gotten to where, like, I I used to, like, draw out the whole conversation. Like, you're talking about, like, Mm. this is the way, like, a script. Yeah. And I found that, like, it never went (laughs) exactly. Like, Butch Harmon's interview was, like, was perfect, right? Like, I had this whole, I mean, I did more research and, like, I was, like, and it didn't, it went off the rails in, like, the first 10 minutes. And so I learned to, like, basically adapt, like you said, and basically riff off of, the answers one you got to let like ask the question and then be willing to shut up and let let yeah. the guest go on and then sort of go off on tangents based on their answers right so yeah i just now i just have like if you saw my notes now like i just have bullet points i have my stock questions but i may know you very well but i mean it's like yeah bullet points of what i want to cover but it could go in a variety of different directions but i think that's what makes a better podcast it's, it doesn't sound like it's like a question and answer type of deal. And then you're, that's what I told you. Like, well, if you have the text and like, you're doing yeah. a better job of like, just let it go and then go where it leads you. So I can't believe we're telling everybody this, right? <laughs> we're giving them the answers. But I said to you at the start, like, that's honestly, like anytime you listen to your podcast, like, you know, it doesn't sound like an interview. 
you know, you have this conversation. Knack. Yeah. And you have this amazing knack of making people feel at ease and people feel comfortable. And, and that's a skill like you, you develop that over time, you know, especially when you would talk about your own career development coming from a guy that was so shy, you wouldn't say boo to a ghost and then having to develop that skill. So I think that's a, a tribute to you. And, you know, a lot of the things like, you know, I picked up from you was like the intro, the music intro, you know, talking a little bit over how to mix that in. Those little things like would be OK. Anytime you're trying to learn something, you go to the best in your business that are doing it like, you know, and there's obviously a far lot better than you, but you happen to be available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course <laughs> you know so like <laughs> you influence like a lot of the stuff that happens you know what i mean so i appreciate that you know it's 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 fantastic when you have somebody you can talk to about that stuff and go hey i don't mind calling fail on myself here and going hey like because i've texted you before and gone that was shit <laughs> you know what i mean like that was awful oh, yeah. man. like yeah. i didn't think that was good at all and you're like yeah, yeah you, you might not be too far from the truth there you know, but you, you, you live and learn. Yeah, it's all right. You know, like you'll you'll text me when you don't think it's a good one either, and I'll, I'll probably prop you up and go. It was a lot better because we were all self critical. But yeah, like a, a lot of that stuff is, is just as you go, you just learn and like, and you know, obviously we, you know, you mentioned to the editing and all that stuff, which is kind of cool. You learn how to do that, and you know, all this like microphone stuff that you you know you learn that you should have one of those and, and spare headphones. Yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> I'm moving into the big time now, man. All right. So you've got all this experience now and you're, mm -hmm. you've done all this research. So somebody asks you a question, guy walks into mm -hmm. your bay or walks into your, on your lesson tee and says, what's your teaching philosophy? What do you tell them? What do you believe in? Human first. And we can go, we can go deep. I mean, I'm talking like just that, but I mean, like technically we all, and yeah. I, it's bullshit if you tell me you don't have preferences, we all do. Like, what oh, do you I like do, to yeah. see? What do you like to see? Because you post, I mean, if, if you guys haven't followed Steven on Instagram, he, he's he's got some great content on there where he posts tour players and, and then his students, and he gives you his feedback on, like, what are these guys doing, right? So talk through a little bit of maybe start to finish of, like, what do you like to see? So pure technique-wise, again, not answer your question, but, like, for me, the most important thing is the perception of the player before I even... I, like this is the way I phrase it to a lot of my players when they come into a session. I'm like, we got two windows. You got your window of setup and perception and understanding and communication. And then you got your window of your backswing. And I think after that, your window closes. And I think I can influence you in both those areas. My preference is to influence in you as early as possible in that process. So that goes into the perception, the understanding and establishing what should happen, what you believe to be happening. And then in terms of actually going into the technique and how the player moves it really is looking at how they take their posture their stance their orientation at setup and how that influences that first move that's i'll go there every single day of the week that's what i look at very very first and then i really like to have establish a really nice relationship early and like them to be in control of the center mass of the golf club early which means what keeping in front of their hands or level with their hands early i don't like that club get yeah i and, and you too can, yeah, P2, like it's B, kind of in and around hand position. I You can go, again, I'm, I'm not trying to stir up any shit here. Oh, yes, you we can are. Go, you can go, you can talk, <laughs> you can talk about anatomical matchups all you like all day long. I, I just don't like people getting the center mass behind their, their hands at P2. Uh, it's just a preference of mine. I, I actually, I wrote this down last night. This wasn't anything to do with us today, but it was like, I did a lesson. I wasn't happy with it. And I was like, is it? their problem with the golf swing or my problem with their golf swing. And that, I thought that was a really, not that I'm going to say it's a great way because I said it because then I'd be saying I'm, I'm great, but it just kind of funneled the kind of thinking about it a little bit. So you got to be careful, obviously, but you're going you're gonna to have preferences. You just are. So for me, I really, really like to see a clean setup, a neutral setup, that going back to that really homeostasis kind of body posture position where they're not going to have to adapt early. So what does that look like? If you had to describe that to the listeners. Very what neutral, is, neither internal, externally rotated, um, good tilts, you know, so that's a little still bit pretty, of side. That's still pretty broad. Like, what are good tilts? Tilting, tilting what? What are we tilting? Like secondary tilts. So like a <laughs> little bit of side, a little bit of upper chest tilt away from golf ball. 
I don't. I like to see the head, the cervical, like the the neck and the head. I like to see them in a nice neutral spot in terms of when you look at a player, it doesn't look like it's lopsided or leaning one way or the other. We're talking about ball ball on the ground here, right? Like the iron. Yeah, ball on the ground before anything's yeah, yeah. happened. I'm trying to get them into as neutral a position as possible, where there's not a preference for a rotation or an external rotation, or internal or any tilts and bends as much as possible. Now you're going to have that little bit of like you know trail side tilt or bend at the setup as you're going to have it you know trail hand being a little bit below lead so i'll be fine with that what about side view what do you like to see side view like do you like to see the the hips tucked under you like to see the butt out like what i don't i don't like a lot of curvature in that lower lumbar so i don't like to see butt out an awful lot i like to see a little bit of like you know you know when you're looking at where the pelvis kind of tilt comes from i like to see a little bit of pelvis tilt I know, I know in theory, there's a little bit of different ways of looking at that in terms of rotation. I feel when you get a player two butt on there, it provides different issues, but I'm not opposed to it. Again, we're talking preferences. Yeah. So like, I wouldn't like a whole lot of posterior tilted setup. Right? I prefer it to be a little bit more anterior, a little bit more pointy belt buckle more t- towards golf ball a little bit without using the lumbar spine to get there. And then from there, I'm looking at, yeah, like I'm looking at balance points. Again, I've had players who've been a little bit armpits out over toes and have done it very, very well. But preference would be getting that hip bone kind of in line with ankle area and then getting that kind of like armpit alignment kind of maybe over middle of toes. So again, going back to that neutral kind of as much as possible, creating those nice balance points. Where I, I, I really focus in on the feet area, so where the pressure goes there, I think that's really, really important. Now how do you measure that or do you ask them or... I have a pressure mat. Okay. Uh, just the V1 pressure mat. So it's not forces or anything, but I'll just, I'll throw them on. I, and then sometimes I'll like, I'll say it to them beforehand. And then I realize like, that's an error. Like you can't, you know, those things where you say something and you're like, shit. So just go, just go do what it, you would have done before I said anything. And it's like, well, the cat's out of the bag now. They're going to do something different. So I try to get them on that early as possible. And then just see if there's anything really, you know, jumping out at me from there. Because once I get them into that, kind of body posture that body orientation to set up i'm looking to see if they adapt early so did they move really early and adapt into a different formation to make up for something and that's really what i'm trying to avoid because if i have early adaptation normally adaptation is going to follow all through the system so i'm trying to make it as simple as possible within their body restrictions and body formations whoever they may be whatever age they may be so i'm trying to get that as much as possible to make it easier I think as soon as they start getting into tilts and bends with either the neck tilting towards trail side or lead side or right or left or the shoulders tilting or the shoulders protracted too excessively, you know, where you feel like you're kind of the back of your shoulders are kind of hunched up and over. Again, Mm -hmm. what that does is it gets that, not to get too complicated, but get that scapula off your rib cage. Again, it's going to provide issues. I just try and as much as possible get into that, into that kind of form. Again, that would be kind of all done pre that where you would like, okay, well, I know why they do that, which is fine if they do that that way. The only downside to doing all that stuff and kind of going that way is you you kind of maybe don't concentrate on the club impact as much as possible. And this is where we go back to, does the body move the club or the club moves the body? And yeah. my understanding and, and my theory on that is I'm going to do as much as I possibly can body-wise, to influence the club on the backswing and to get it in the best possible position for the player in front of me. And I'm going to use the body to do that. Once that transition piece hits, I don't think there's a whole lot they can do about it unless they had previous intention to hit a certain type of shot. So in that 0.3 average, whatever you want to say, downswing time, I don't think there's a lot going on there. I think they're reacting to what the club does. How do you train that then? Like, Let's just, let's just say, look, I mean, I'm spitballing, but... What we're seeing every day, right, aside from our really good players and our tour players, is, is yeah, the club golfer steepening of the shaft, swinging too far to the left, whatever. Like, how are you going to change that ever critical, like, four to five, I think, is, like, mm-hmm. what separates the good coaches from the average coaches to be able to change that pattern. And I can change it, but, I mean, yeah. it's that's probably the most difficult piece, I think, for most players. 100%. Like talk us through that. How would you do that or any drills or say you're happy with the backswing, right? Let's just say, let's say you're happy with the backswing, right? Just paint the picture. Okay. You've got the energy in the club and 
whatever you think is a good backswing in the club face, like how, and then, it, and then it's, you know, it's coming off plane or steepening or whatever. How do you, how do you change that? There'd be a variety, like it would really depend on the player I have in front of me and what, how they like to communicate, to be honest with you. So if I've got a player that likes drills, that likes very exact kind of movement, I might get them up there and go with that like little Chris Como trail elbow towards ball kind of feel to kind of shallow it out a little bit. So you just, when you get up top of backswing, if you're a right-handed golfer and you have your trail elbow, just start moving that in a diagonal way towards golf ball to create that sensation or that little feel. If it's more a player that isn't that technically savvy, perhaps, I'll more maybe revert back to a little bit of mirror stuff. So I'll get them, and I've used it before, where I'll kind of maybe get them set up in front of our monitor, and I'll have mm-hmm. a mirror below the monitor, and I'll put them into different positions, ask them to reenact it in the mirror. So they're really getting the autonomy of it. They're in control of the movement. They're creating it. When you say putting them into the position, you're putting your hands on them and moving them, or you're like modeling? No, no. So I'm, 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 I'm showing them positions. So I'll kind of get So them you're in. doing it and having them copy you. Mm-hmm. Or I'll I'll get them to copy a monitor. So I'll put up like a position that I'd like. Like I'll pick a player and kind of go, okay, well, this is where I'd like it to be a P5 on the monitor. And then the mirror will be below the monitor. And they have to kind of replicate what they see in the monitor in the mirror by them doing it. It doesn't always work. Obviously, as you know, you're trying all these different things. But that gives them the affordance to create it themselves. And I think I will get hands on if I have to, but I'm going to afford them every opportunity to not do that. Right. Just my way of thinking. Cause I believe, <laughs> I believe this is my acid test. I'm like, all right, dude, like how much, again, this is where we got to differ. It's like how much in my opinion, how much learning is going to take place. And maybe you could do it differently, but anyway, this is my perception of it. How much learning is going to take place if I keep putting you there? And I don't know. So if I walk out the door and I'm no longer there to put you there, how are you going to do it? And that's just my, now you could come back and go, well, I'm not putting them there every time. I'm doing it twice and then check and see if they can recreate that sensation. I'm like, cool. Yeah. Right. That's, I get that. But my goal is always, and as I start delving more into the, a little bit of the performance side of things is when I leave and they go into their practice session, I got to give them tools to be able to do this. They have to be able to do it yeah. some way or another. Right. Yeah. And so what I'll go is I'll go to them. Okay. And they'll go, okay, well, I don't have a mirror. And I'm like, absolutely. You don't have a mirror, but you do have a phone. All right, so you're going to prep your phone onto the camera mode and you're going to reverse the camera and you're going to be able to see yourself when you prop the phone in your bag behind you and you're going to do the exact same thing. But you have to teach them like how to rehearse that. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, yeah. so you're just like basically verbalizing that and they're going to like magically yeah. do it? Well, they're going to move <laughs> like that in the mirror. They're going to replicate the movement in the mirror. Okay. And then if we can do that enough times... Then we see whether that sticks or not. Now, again, these are all different avenues. So I can still go, I can still kind of go like that Chris Como. And again, you know, how they're creating it would obviously have this big influence on it, right? So if they're getting to the top there and they're not moving anything and they're just like literally throwing arms from the top of backswing, you can kind of maybe get them creating a little bit more side bend earlier, perhaps kind of do that stuff. You could maybe kind of go, if it's kind of more in around the golf ball related, kind of go three ball drills or kind of putting something down there to influence that too. So it really, really depends. The player I have in front of me, how they like to be communicated to, their golf IQ, and then what really works. So how can I, how can I get it across to them? And I'll go through a few different things. Like I've no qualms about trying something and then five minutes in going, you know, that sense of that kind of body movement, that body language where they're hating it and they're not getting it. And I'll back out of it and go, no, that, that's not working. Let's go do something yeah. else. Yeah, pivoting is a big part of it, if you know. Yeah. You got to go Absolutely. in the, another direction. Yeah, like, again, and that kind of goes back to body movement. I, again, there's a reason why they get steep. So why do they do what they do? You know, and mm, generally yeah. that's going to be kind of influenced by what they do in backswing. So, But what if it isn't? I've really yet to come across some that I was like, Man, that is like one great got one great backswing, and then you're going to get as steep as hell on the way down. It'll be uh, it'll be strange. It'll be a bit of an outlier. Be fun though, because it'd be messy. <laughs> you know, like again, like if I was if I was outside, if I had the opportunity, I'm outside. I might just get to hit off side hill. You know, you could go somewhere like that with them too. Change the environment. Yeah, exactly. Like, so you go, yeah, you know, you can go that way too. 
if it's like a real trail arm issue, I might go cat handed, get them to hit a few shots like that, kind of involve that trail side a little bit more. So it just really depends on who I have in front of me. Okay. Tough question. It is, but it, you got to have like a, you got you to have like a perfect example of like what you want to, yeah, you know. but, but I think we all sort of have our preferences as far as like, what do we like to see? Like, I, I guess it'd be a better question. Like, what don't you like to see? I don't like, like you said, I don't like to see the center mass rolled inside. I don't like to see the hand straight up over somebody's head. Right. I don't like to see the shaft coming down on somebody, you know, on somebody's nose. Right. It's like, you know, stuff like that is like, what do we, you know, what, what do we don't like? And like, okay, work away from that. Like, okay, well, I think it'd probably be advantageous if the club shallowed a little bit and like flattened and lowered. Right. So it's like all this stuff, like we're not making everybody look exactly the same, but you're still working off of like a framework. That's, that's the tricky thing is like, yeah. Am I trying to make him look like something I want to see him look like? Or is this the actual issue? And, you know, then you go, okay, well, what do I do best, right? So if I start putting my hands on people tomorrow for half an hour, like I might get sued. You know what I mean? Because like, you know, it's not, I promise it's not you, you I, won't. No, I've I'm, been doing I'm it for joke. 30 years. <laughs> yeah. But basically the skill of it, right? You know what I mean? As we said, it is a skill. The, it is a skill. It's a hundred percent a skill, right? Yeah. So I go put some my hands on someone tomorrow. I better know what I'm doing. Yes. But I know what I can say and I know how to phrase things to elicit movement. And I had right. this conversation with George too. And George are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you know, yeah, well, yeah he's like another sure, level. Like, well, yeah. Well, like, I'm like, if I pay, if I pay four guys to hang around beside me, I'm going to get them moving people too. You know what I mean? So it's right. like, yeah, he's got assistance moving people, you know, look, who's really successful at stuff. And you go, you, co- you go copy them again. You're just influenced by how you're brought up and how you like to do things. And, like I was very, very lucky, you know, that I was when I first started playing golf. The day I joined my local golf club was the day we got our local golf pro, and that turned out to be Shane O'Grady, who is coaching Leona McGuire. He was on LPGA Tour now, the Irish player, mm-hmm. and so he influenced me a lot when I was younger. And I, I, I'm for sure pretty convinced a lot of the influence of how I teach is based on that, you know, just subconsciously. What do you remember from that those days, like when you was a lot of a technical student? stuff. A lot of technical stuff. Because he was, you know, when I kind of hear about it now, like, you know, the the kind of phrases and stuff, like he, you know, he talked about the golf or the golf machine and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't know what it was back then. He also said I did a lot of unnatural things naturally in my golf swing, which I, I like. I always like to hang on to that. Mm-hmm. That's good. He wanted me to stop, like, you know, he, he grabbed my mom at one stage. It was just like, you got to get him to stop reading magazines and, and looking on TV at golf instruction stuff. He just used too much in his head. So I was, even then I was like very technically minded because again, I started later than everybody else. So I got, it's the same life is repeating itself. You know, I had to get better real fast. And to do that, there was only a route to go. It's just the way it is, you know, but going back to the technical stuff, then it's like, it goes, it goes branch out and you're like, all right, you're again, you're influenced by what you do. So you see a lot of body movement. You're going to see a lot of body movement. And then the stuff I'm doing now with, you know, working into the kind of the breathing side of things is like, the fun stuff with Neuro Peak Pro and their live breathing feedback. And that's a nice avenue to go down to what I'm learning about, you know? So it's, it's, it's all more trending towards the human and the movement rather than golf specific stuff. Maybe I like See it. how that goes. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's like a combination of all the stuff. Absolutely. Like in we're influenced, yeah. you know, I, I remember stuff that the weird stuff that you remember from, people you spent time with over the years and it's like, it all comes full circle and then you kind of evolve into, to you, your authentic, your authentic self as, as a coach and you got to be you and what you, what you know works. Like I had a guy today who did exactly what you're talking about. So, you know, I kind of not played a whole lot of golf, bit left-hander, big slice, right to left, took the club back low early outside, no rotation of the body, high hands, pull the crap out of on the way down to create as much force and speed as possible, pull away across the golf ball. So first establish, do you know why you hit that slice pattern? No. Okay. Well, here's why you know, ball to target line club traveling further right than face. Didn't really maybe get that. Okay. So then we went to kind of just analogy, right? Well, I just stood in front of the golf ball and said like, listen, I'm a wall and you're playing soccer. How would you move it around the wall? And he got that and he understood that. And then we went, okay, let's just hit some short shots, trying to create that path with the club head face orientation was pretty decent 
And so we did that in very, very small swings. And then we we're like, okay, let's go back a little bit further. And when we went back further, he still had that little pull down. So it was kind of like, okay, well, for the moment, we won't stretch it back that much further. We'll just work on creating that awareness of you in around impact. And then you go jump maybe a little bit then into, okay, well, forward planning versus exact movement. So you go, okay, well, as I say to people, if I have to be in my bay, I'm like, if you want to go to Toronto, I can point to Toronto on a map and you'll find your own way there. You'll self-organize or self-gather. Or I can tell you literally go out the door, turn left, turn right, turn left, go down that road for, and you'll arrive in Toronto. Which one works for you? I, I don't know until I really test them out. So I'll show you impact. Can you gather yourself enough to get there into a better impact position? Like one of those most beautiful things is, you know, show me what you think you should be an impact. Oh, yeah. And like, you you know, you asked your player that. Like, so that was that guy today. Like he had a hands a little bit behind ball at setup, a little bit scoopy. I'm like, where should you be at impact? And he goes, kind of like this. I'm like, no, you should be actually like this. And he goes, oh, so I should set up like this then. I'm like, yeah. So freezers are okay. Yeah, I actually, I was on an online today with a player. And we were talking about, again, here's where it just goes back to that stuff. I remember when I started working for Scotty Cox and people would say, yeah, but you're not posting like any patterns. You know, why aren't you posting? And I'm like, because I'm not Scott Cox. Like, and so I have preferences, but I don't predestine every lesson to be in a certain way right so it's kind of like if if i feel like a player would benefit more from going to impact i'll get them there or stop them halfway down in their normal golf swing and go okay well how do you expect to get the club from from that point to the golf ball oh i'd have to do this i'm like okay well this might be more beneficial okay and then you can see and see how they develop and so but i'll give them autonomy and time but yeah like getting a player to impact and showing them where they they might want to be or might be preferable to be can sometimes be enough of a change, enough of a perception change that they start enacting it themselves. If they don't, then you can kind of like guide them along, but you never want to be back in the herd, climbing the mountain with them. You want to be just a guide, but I, I have no problem if freezer swings are what's required. No problem with creating an awareness of positions at times. You know, I was working with a guy on skillless this morning in Tampa and we were talking about that and we were trying to create a little separation from upper and lower in transition where he was getting a little bit on getting that center mass of his chest a little bit on top of the pelvis early. So mm -hmm. we we're trying to create a little bit of separation. And that was the question, should we use freezer swings? And I'm like, you know what, when we're working on something that involves sequencing, I would prefer not. I yeah. would prefer you to have a little bit of fluidity in the system to work on that, preferably. That's the only where I would kind of work away from them is you are playing around when you go into freezer swings, you're playing around with momentum and that can create some issues. But again, like, listen, it's, that's why people pay the money they pay to come see you. Do you know, because you're there to make those decisions in that time where you're going to know right. shit, man. I like, you might do something tomorrow that you've never done before in your entire life. You might just look around your bay and see something like, like a leaf floats in or something. You're like, Oh, but that's why you are what you are. And that's why you're so good. Cause it'd be very easy to set up every lesson the same and just do it like a kind of like a rolling carpet and just kind of come in and come in, come in, come in. Yeah. That'd be and, boring. You know, I'll though, help right? you. I can help. And I, I won't. <laughs> it'd be boring. Right. I mean, it's like, it's yeah, not even hundred percent. Right. You got to. But no, I get it. Like, I'm not saying I do freezers a lot. I'm just saying there are some situations where I always say everything, everything starts with a proper concept. That's where impact concept can be, I think, important, right? If somebody thinks that address and, and impact are the same, then we got a problem, right? You're starting with a with a flawed concept. But I do like to get things going in motion. How do you feel about like slow motion rehearsals, right? Like that, I'm kind of big on the, doing that. Which all it's all in the flow of like exaggerating the opposite of what you don't want, but. I'll be absolutely fine. I'll go back to that car analogy when you first start learning to drive. And I'll use the fact that I was in Ireland driving stick. And like, you know, there was no way in the world my mom was going to let me go at any miles an hour when I didn't know how to change a gear. So it's the same principle. You go back to a, like, if you want to ingrain a new pattern, you got to be efficient at it first or competent, and then you can kind of add speed to the system. So I would be a hundred percent like that. It, again, you know, in this, I, I don't think there's any, one particular way to do it when i did the skill coaching alliance course which is a fantastic course john dunnigan will Wu, great guys you know a little bit more external stuff you know learning kind of thing, motor learning fantastic yeah yep. but again that's 
not the be all and end all for everybody. You know what I mean? Like you've got to kind of change things around for other players. So, and, and if you're good, you get all gambit of players, you know, you're going to get them all. Like you can put your shit up on Instagram and be this type of person. And I've got guys to come to me that go, I have an idea what we're going to do. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. You know, and sometimes it can be, sometimes it can be exactly what they think it is, like where they kind of change. Not very often. <laughs> Not very often because they're probably doing something that they didn't even know they were doing. So I find that really, that period of questioning in the last half hour, I find really difficult to answer because it creates an issue for me where I perceive that I should know and have a better answer, but I don't have a better answer because I believe I'm a better coach. And I know that sounds a little bit of a kind of like a paradox, but I believe that not knowing the answer to those questions leaves you open to learning more and being more malleable or at like changeable in a lesson. So being more like a comedian a little bit in terms of what you're doing. But it's rep- it can get represented as in, yeah, you don't like to do stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you give me a player who wants to get better and they're going to work on it, I'll do everything within my power to get you good i'll go ask anybody right if i don't know the answer to it i'll go like ask you or ask mark or any of those guys Mm. you know it's 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 all good i have no problems with being with learning or or being wrong on things and again i'm relatively still learning as i go you know what i mean like i'm still learning stuff i'm still learning new things every day so it's uh but that's the fun part of it like I journal every night, every lesson, and you go down, you write, man, that was that sucked, man. That was fucking awful that lesson today. Why was it awful though? What 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 sucked about it? Like I talk too much. You gotta stop talking so much, Steve. <laughs> I was about to ask up, you, dude. like, like, what do you think has changed since you like first started teaching full time, or just started teaching in general to now? Like, what do you think? What's improved, and then. What can you share of like, what's, what's different? Yeah. Like, you know, when, when I first started like five years ago, let's say of this, like kind of mission to get better, the, the whole goal of the mission, so to speak, was I'm good with communication. I suck at technic. So it was like, I got to get technically better. I got to understand movement. I got to understand center mass. I got to understand body movement, all that stuff. So that was the really kind of wide, you know, goal, so to speak. I think I've gotten an awful lot better at that. I'm, I'm constantly delving or dipping into the pool of imposter syndrome you know and, and trying and trying to deal with that an awful lot of times I'm, I'm probably my own worst critic so that's why i do what i do in terms of writing down and trying to learn i think i've become a lot more confident in my decisions i think is the biggest change i've seen in the last four years where you know i, I don't doubt myself in lessons anymore i'm like if i see something and i move a player towards that i'm you know if i'm confident in it I, i'm gonna fall kind of like really really full steam ahead i'm gonna follow it through and i think that's that's just growing with how you kind of like you know interact with people getting your feet underneath you a little bit obviously leaving the head pros job last year and going full-time coaching opens you up to to more players and better players as i got better players i've learned more as i progress with them and, and involved other coaches like mark learning more about like 3d movement and so forth so i think in terms of the whole thing my competence has risen and my confidence has risen with that. My skills have gotten better. How I see things has gotten better. My self-awareness has gotten better. You know, I just think overall I'm a, I'm a lot more wholly complete as a golf coach than, than I was before. And that's fun. Like, again, a lot of people have helped me get there, but yeah. It's good. It's not not the end though, man. I got to keep, I got to keep going. No, no. Yeah. You're, we've never arrived. Right. But I mean, yeah, you're on the journey, but like, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to start seeing the fruits of your labor. And again, you've, you've put it, you've put in the work. I mean, that's like, there's no doubt. Like there's nobody that can say that you haven't put in more time than in your, in the short amount of time that you've been on this journey. Like it's crazy. I'm not even going to list all your certifications, but it's insane of like how much time you've spent with, with uh, experts. Like, how can you do it? You know what I mean? And like, I don't know who it was, but uh, was it Martin Luther King? If you can't, was it? If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, do something else. Like get there wherever you can. Like there's, there's one of my favorite movies, Any Given Sunday. 
Al Pacino gives like that speech at the end, man. Oh, the, the locker room speech inch. is classic. Every inch. And you, that's why I wake up every day. I'm like, just crawl for it. Like, you don't know how what you're doing today is going to have an effect on tomorrow. And that's really, really important, I think, for anybody trying to self-develop or self-improve. It's that little thing that sometimes, sometimes life blesses you with like great results and you do something and you get this great result and this instant satisfaction from it. You're like, that's how it should be every time. And that's not how life is. And then you go back the next day and there's no big glory, but yet you got to do the same stuff you did the day before the glory. And if you can do that, I think that's when that good stuff really, really happens. But that's tough. You know, it's, it's, it's the discipline of it all. Again, we're always kind of fighting our battles, right? And then I listened to a podcast the other day and James Cleary, guy that wrote Atomic Habits, another really good book. I don't know if you have any books to recommend, but I was listening to, he was a guest on a podcast and I was like, shit, this is like, I mean, you know, we're all battling with like, like you said, like you, you changed your habits, right? Which has changed the outcomes of, of your, of your goals, right? But I I was going to read this to you and just see what you thought about it. It's like, what's your unfulfilled need behind your desire to work so hard? Like that is, that is like as deep as, as the guts of, of Dr. K. <laughs> I think that goes, would you, would you phrase that as your why? hundred percent. Yeah. Why do we, why do we do what we do? Right. It's like, I, I'll, I'll set it up and I'll let you answer. Like when I first started getting, like when I start, started working for Dana and, you know, I think I've talked about this on the podcast. It's like, she's the first mentor of mine or the mentor or person that's like, asked me like, what do you really want? Right. Big question. What do you want? Right. And I said, I, I, one, I want to be, you know, the best teacher I can be or a top teacher. And at the time, it's like everybody wants to be on a list of some, some sort, right? It's not everything. And then two, which I, I sort of ponder a lot and don't agree with a lot sometimes is like I want to be respected by my peers, right? Is that really important? And for me, I, I'm a people pleaser and I, that's sort of the way I'm wired is like that was important to me. So we talked, you know, earlier about, you know, maybe not giving a crap about yeah. what everybody thinks about us, right? Which there has to be some of that, I think, in greatness. So what would be your answer to that question? What's your why? I, I think it's not a thought concept. It's more of a feeling concept. And I'll go back to four years ago, standing on the driving range at the Honda Classic and feeling complete. That's my why. I don't think I can put, and I've tried, believe me, I've tried because a lot of people you'll talk to will ask for that why. Why do you do what you do? Why do you get up at like 6.30 every morning and go study for two hours before you even... I want to be the best at what I do because I want to help as many people as possible because I want to feel the way I feel or felt on that driving range when I was in that atmosphere where I could see the best in the world around me. And I'm like, I want to be here. And in that 100% of that vibe, there's probably a percentage of wanting to be validated percentage of wanting to be famous a percentage of wanting to be successful financially absolutely right because I, I totally agree I think you would be borderline inhuman if you didn't want some of that if you didn't totally like we all want to be liked a little we all worry about 100% people. think about us you're not yeah. human if you're not it's an inside out job but the outside has influence so I, I think it's a really hard question for me to answer because I've been searching for that same answer myself. And that's a great answer in itself, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, all I can tell you is that the emotions I get from what I do when it goes, when I do it well, or when I li like read a new book or on golf, it's just unparalleled to anything else. And I, I really, really like that. And I think maybe it's a little bit of creating a, a lasting impression on how, not I leave this earth is probably a bit traumatic, but I think I was destined for more than I've achieved to this point. And I think I'm really, really good at what I do. And I would like to explore that even more. Love it, man. That's my guy right there. That's my guy right there. That's the, that's the self-belief yeah. that I know you should have because you are great and you're destined for greatness. Again, I'm human. Like it's tough. Like ask me a question. I don't know the answer. It's, it's like, 
I don't like that. You know what I mean? But you have to be okay with it. You have to be okay with not knowing because that's the only reason we learn. As you've always said to me, you know, if, if failure gave seminars, you know, from Jim, like yeah. they'd be the most popular seminar. Well, they should have been. Probably wouldn't be. But yeah, just try to do the best you can, you know, like it's, it's like and push it. Like don't regrets cost more than time. Yeah. And we'll ask you that in, in 30 years. All right. The last question is if you had to get a group text to the world mm-hmm. or put a, a phrase on a metaphorical billboard to the world, what would you say and why? Don't let my K drive you around anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hire him as an Uber driver. <laughs> if you ever see my K as an Uber driver in Arizona, don't ever go. Ah, there, there be two in my head. I, I like the Brett McCabe one. Be hard on yourself, but don't shit on yourself. But I, I think because I've already said that, I, I'm going to go with another one, and it's just show up. Mm. And and I don't even mean it as a physical. I mean, just fucking do it. Like you know what I mean? If you like, I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me in this process where I've been sitting at home and I'm like, oh man, what a day. I'll probably just like, and I go, you know what? Let's just press play on that podcast that Jace did. Let's listen. Or let's just open that book. Or let's just press that video on YouTube because somebody did something that Matt done. And you get a little nugget in that information. And that little nugget the next day becomes a little bit more bigger. And then the next day it becomes a little bit bigger. And then you call someone who knows more about that nugget, who knows someone else. And then you get them on your podcast and then they know. And this like stream of great things happen because of one thing, one moment in time when you went, no. I'm not going to take the easy way out. I'm not going to mail it in. I'm going to turn up. Yeah. And if you can do that, say yes to a lot more things than you say no to and turn up, great things happen in my mind. Awesome, man. What a great way to close, brother. I mean, fantastic stuff. Thank you for sharing. Thanks so much for your time. Tell the listeners like how they can get a hold of you, how they can can follow you on social, how they can give you a wave and and say thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, It's at Steve Moore Golf on Instagram. Same on Twitter. I think the same on TikTok, but I'm not. It's really the same content that I just spread across all platforms. I don't do any dancing. And then the website is yeah, stevemoregolf.com. You can hit that up too. Kind of learn a little bit more about me. But I'm pretty gettable. I'm happy to respond to text messages. I like again, man. Like like you, we just love doing this, so we're always happy to chat about it. It's not a career; it's more of a path. Yeah, and and listen to his podcast, Shamrock. Absolutely, sorry, and Shamrocks Shanks. And Shanks. Yeah. yeah, Shamrocks and Shanks. Yeah. As I said, my goal is to get past Page, Page Sporanic on the U.S. chart. So once we do that, um, I'm going to close it down because there's not much left after reading. Awesome, man. You're the best. I appreciate you. Thanks, man. What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with just a couple of things before you jump off. First, big thank you to Steve for coming on the show and sharing his story and insights on golf instruction and coaching. That was a really fun conversation. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please give him a follow on social at Steve Moore Golf on all your social platforms, especially on Instagram. He's a great follow there. Also, follow me and reach out to me on Twitter or Instagram at Golf Guru TV. That's Golf Guru TV. And check out my website golfgurutv.net where you can find videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching if you dig deep enough. If you have a question or comment, you can email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com or just hit me up on the DM. Music from this episode was brought to you by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And also a huge shout out to my producer, Joel North, for an incredible job on this production and future productions of the Golf Guru Show. And as I leave you with, The infamous quote from Mr. Jim Rohn, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.